good morning, everyone. It's Katie Crysdale here, Wednesday, May 6th. Welcome, welcome, good morning, good afternoon. Welcome, thank you for being here today. Thanks for joining us. This is a, a different, a bit more of a difficult topic. So I know there's not as many registered today because a lot of people don't want to lift up this rock, right? They don't want to go there when we talk about uh, legal proceedings that result from court cases and different drowning injuries. If you're new here, let us know where you're from. Welcome. Let us know your city, your location, um, any questions that you have, welcome. I see some names that I recognize, I see some names that I don't. I'm gonna go ahead and pop in the show notes from Wednesday and Monday this week. So I have caught up on the different uh, show notes from last week. So last week on Wednesday, we had the Junior Lifeguard Club. That session is fully updated with the show notes and the recording. Friday, May 1st, we had the webinar with Jason Simituk on how to use surveys and statistics to help um, document your facility needs. So those are both done. Monday, we had the Mermaid Camp and Lifeguard Games session. All of the show notes are done. I just had to remove the recording from YouTube briefly. I'm finding when I make video edits, they're not always saving. And so I need to update the video link. There's about 60 seconds at the beginning that don't need to be there from a tech issue. So welcome. Let me put those show notes in. So welcome. I see Abdel Rahman is here from Morocco, living in Qatar or Qatar. Qatar. Welcome. Karen is saying that she's so glad that they're recorded. You've been thrown into record keeping, and I'm watching the videos in nooks and crannies of life. Welcome, Karen from Idaho. I have, I also hear you. I have podcasts that I will listen to five minutes while I'm cooking, ten minutes while I'm walking. Uh, live is very hard to show up to at the moment, so I know that the recording has been a great unintended consequence, and these webinars will live on well past COVID 2019, and I think that's been a really great silver lining for me because I thought, who would have thought two months ago that we'd get sick of live recordings, but most people are sick of live events, so I hear you on that. So I've posted the show notes for those two sessions in the chat box. Welcome, welcome. So today we will be hearing from Trevor Sherwood. He'll be starting in about 20 minutes, uh, 25 minutes, so shortly after the hour. Trevor, I know from a course that I took with him, he is, among other things, a instructor with the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance. And so he taught my advanced service technician course a couple years ago, and I got to meet him at the World Aquatic Health Conference in New Jersey, which was really, really great. So um, I'm so excited that he agreed to present today. He is an expert witness in all kinds of uh, cases, both drowning, uh, pool operations, water quality, mechanical. So he's going to bring a lot of expertise to today's session. I've asked him to talk about how we can improve our pools in terms of common mistakes that he sees, documentation deficiencies or procedural deficiencies that end up coming up in court cases. So welcome to those of you that are here. Welcome. Also today I'm doing another mug giveaway. So I realized it's been almost two weeks since we did a mug giveaway. So we'll be giving away two mugs today. These are the campfire soup mugs. If you'd like a chance to win one of these, we have an Instagram post for today that I will put in the chat box. One moment. So today's secret question, if you'd like to win one of the mugs, you can go to the Instagram post that I've put in the chat box. And uh, please, the secret question is, I'd like you to comment, what is a silver lining from this COVID pandemic? So what is one good thing that has come out of this 
vast life experience that we've all shared. So having work stop, our pools close, uh, working from home, maybe homeschooling your kids, spending more time with your family, your pets. Let me know if you would like a chance to win the mug, you need to comment what is one good thing that has come out of the last six, eight, 10 weeks that your life has been disrupted. I think that's where I'm myself focusing the next week or two is I really want to think what are the opportunities that have come as a result of this? How can I have some positive forward motion and momentum while still acknowledging that there are challenges that we all face in terms of returning to normal life? Um, it's been really distressing. I've been watching all of the different aquatic professionals on the various Facebook groups that I belong to. Uh, lifeguard authority, women in parks and recreation, the certified pool operator groups, the equitable aquatics group. It's so distressing for me up here in Canada to, I, I feel for those of you that are being pushed to open your pools as soon as possible because state or federal guidelines have allowed the economy to reopen, have allowed facilities to reopen. And I think it's a lot of us are stuck in a rock and a hard place because the right decision is not necessarily the basic legal decision. So if we think about standard of care in the aquatics industry, what we do at our facilities, what we do with our staff, many of us I'm sure in the room would say that we do more than the state or provincial standard. We do more than the training or brand standard for our first aid or lifeguarding agency. And I think we really need to consider what do we want to represent as aquatic facilities? What do we want to put forward when we reopen? How do we want to react? How do we want to respond? Both from a safety and risk management perspective, but also as a brand. Do you as a pool, does it represent the brand of your facility or your organization to be the first to reopen? Is that important to you? Or is it more important that you're considerate of your staff and your community and your ratepayers and how you respond? So I don't have all the answers, but that's something that's really been on my mind. I recorded a little a little video shortly before I hopped on here, trying to articulate my thoughts because it's 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 very sad for me to watch these pools reopen right away, and I I think it's a mistake, and I don't know what the right reopening is for each person. I don't know what the right procedure is for each facility, but I think we need to be a little bit more cautious than some people are being, which is unfortunate. So good morning. I see Catherine is here from Saskatoon. Catherine, I definitely put your name on an envelope with two stickers, so that will be coming. Um, those of you that had requested stickers, those are in the mail. I think I've completed almost every envelope uh, for every request for stickers that I've received. If there's somebody that didn't get a chance to sign up for a sticker, let me know. I can pop that link in the chat box. Uh, good morning. I see Lisa from Creston, BC. Lisa, I saw a video from Creston. I don't know if you created it. It's been floating around the Alberta Aquatics Professional page about uh, it was a staffing a staff aquatics video i didn't watch it but i have it pinned to watch in the future okay awesome i'll have to go back and and look at that i did pin it on my facebook page uh, to watch later but congratulations it's getting a lot of yeah the whistle challenge it's getting a lot of traction if you want to post the link lisa uh, in the chat box that would be great because i'm sure other people are interested in seeing it it's been quite popular in our alberta association of aquatics professional group um, that is a good tie-in for me to let you guys know. Uh, the Alberta Association of Aquatic Professionals, the AAAP, we are hosting their meeting next week, Monday, May 11th, on this platform, Click Meeting. So it is primarily geared towards aquatic professionals in the province of Alberta. We won't restrict anyone else from attending, but all of the door prizes and all of the questions will be solicited from Alberta professionals. So let me post the link for that in the chat box. I see some names from Alberta that are not registered who may be interested in hearing that session. So the AAAP session next week will be Monday, May 11th. After the pool aid webinar, I have a 20 minute break and we'll be starting at One Mountain. We're hosting Kevin Jaronsik from Alberta Health Services. So he's going to be providing a pool update. 
So if you are interested in registering, uh, please pre-register. That helps us know how many people are coming. Again, it is the AAAP meeting. We are just hosting it on Click Meeting to facilitate the community meeting remotely because typically the meeting is in person. Uh, so thank you, Lisa, for sending the link. Hopefully it works for others that would like to watch it. Welcome. Uh, Karen says she loved the whistle challenge. Hi, Cheryl Ann from High River. Welcome. Julie is here. Julie, excuse me, is here from Perryville, Missouri. Reopening May 11th. I definitely wish you luck. I mean, that's that's tough. And it's I can't even imagine. Really, I can't. I think this would be I can't imagine if I was in a municipal job right now. I'm pretty outspoken as it is. I uh, have had a different employment situations because of it, but I just can't understand from my perspective why we would reopen right away. It's just missing. Trevor, I see Trevor's here. Uh, you are welcome. All good. We see Trevor. Hi, can you hear me okay? Perfect. Nice. Yeah, awesome. So you're welcome to stay on or you can mute yourself and I'll continue with the pre-show for another 15 minutes. Totally up to you. Sure, I'll listen in now. Okay, perfect. So uh, if you just want to mute your mic, Trevor, so there's no rebound right now with your speakers playing my uh, output. Uh, welcome those of you who are just coming in. We'll be starting in about 15 minutes. Uh, those of you who had requested stickers, those have been sent out. So if you do receive your stickers, send me a tag on Facebook or Instagram. It's great to see the person behind the sticker. I've sent out over 97 stickers and I, I, I don't know what everyone looks like. So send me a photo if you're comfortable, a selfie just with the sticker and a tag where you're located. That would be amazing. I will post in the chat box our Facebook page. The last couple webinar announcements will be coming up before the weekend. So Tammy's asking about stickers. So I did a sticker exchange. I will post the link in the chat box. If you would like a sticker from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants, I'll mail it to you free of charge. If your aquatics department or your facility has a sticker or a magnet that you'd like to trade back, that's great. I would love to receive your sticker. If you don't, then that's perfectly okay. We're, we understand. So let me post the sticker link in the chat box. We are also doing another mug giveaway today. So we've given away so far six different mugs and we're doing another giveaway today on Instagram. One moment, I'm just grabbing the link. So this will be the link if you'd like to sign up for the sticker exchange. Please use this link in the chat box. And then today, the mug giveaway. Let me show you the mugs if you just came in. So I have these campfire mugs. They're really nice for soup, for whatever you're eating. And if you've been uh, Canada, these campfire style mugs with the speckle are very popular. So I'm giving away two of those today. Anywhere in the world, I will mail them. We've had winners so far from Virginia, from British Columbia, from New Brunswick, from Ontario. So if you would like to win the mug, you need to comment on today's Instagram post, which I will link in the chat box. The secret question you need to answer in the comment on Instagram is what is one good thing to come out of COVID-19. So that way I know that the comment comes from somebody who was watching the webinar. <laughs> Tammy says she loves mugs. So you need to comment on the Instagram post, like the post please, and then I'll randomly select two winners later today. It is Wednesday, so the winners will be announced in my Instagram stories for the Lakeview Aquatic Consultants Facebook page, or excuse me, Instagram page and then we'll confirm them on Friday's show as well. So if you'd like to win, please uh, comment there. So thank you so much, those of you coming in. I will also, in a couple minutes, we've got a lot of links in the chat box. I'll post the show notes for today, which gives you a full rundown of all the resources that Trevor, our speaker, has shared with me. If you're coming in so far, let us know where you're from, city, state, province. That's helpful for Trevor to see when he's talking what kinds of states we have represented. I recognize a lot of your names, but every speaker is in a different location. So it's great for him in New Jersey to see uh, where you're located. 
interesting about New Jersey, I just listened yesterday to the New York Times, the daily podcast they have. I listened to an episode from back in March interviewing the first individual from New Jersey who uh, contracted COVID-19 from a medical conference in New York City. Really, really interesting perspective. There's only so much COVID I wanna listen to or hear about, but it was a really interesting interview talking with him. He was a physician's assistant and his experience with the virus. So I see Christine is here from Las Vegas. Welcome, Carrie from Allentown, Pennsylvania, Jennifer from Ohio, Taryn from Putnam, Putnam, Connecticut. I see lots more names in the chat box, so please let us know where you're from, that's helpful. Other things we've got going on this week, so reminder on Friday, we will have our session on equitable aquatics with Kate Connell and Sydney Stadola from the city of Iowa City. Kate, you might know from the Equitable Aquatics Facebook group, they're going to be doing an inventory of how you can make your aquatic program suitable for different audiences from a socioeconomic perspective, from a staffing perspective. Welcome. I see Tammy's here from Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. I know where that is. My husband's family is from Hagerstown, Maryland, so I know exactly where Chambersburg is. Elizabeth is here from Virginia. Jennifer is here from Charleston, South Carolina. So Jennifer, I said a little bit earlier, I actually met Trevor at the World Aquatic Health Conference in Charleston, South Carolina two years ago. So great to have you here. Uh, Christine is saying that she has a brother who goes, uh, who's a grad from Ames. Jill is here from Ames, Iowa. Welcome, Jill. Jill was involved in our high volume committee that presented two weeks ago on Monday. It was April. Let me look one moment. It feels like so long ago. Monday, April, I, I guess it was 27th, we had our panelists from the high volume committee discussing different considerations when pools do reopen. So safety, staffing, risk management, just some basics that we've been discussing as a small group and working through some issues. Paul is here from Reno, Nevada. Anybody else who's just joining us, please let us know where you're from. We have a couple giveaways in the chat box, and I'm going to the show notes for today. Interesting for today's show notes, I was putting on our Facebook page this morning some different videos that I use when I train lifeguards. So different security footage, drowning incidents that are available on YouTube when I train lifeguards or lifeguard instructors. And I thought that the one I posted this morning called a series of unfortunate events, I thought it was a really well-known video that everyone in aquatics had seen it. And the number of shares and engagements in just the first 60 minutes told me otherwise. So the video I will post in the chat box is a great resource for training lifeguards and creating a conversation about who's responsible in different situations. Hello, Jose from Dieppe, New Brunswick in Canada. I'm glad we have some Canadians this morning because I had quite a few direct messages from Canadians saying, well, should I come? Is it relevant to me? Do we, we don't really have aquatic litigation in Canada, except for the University of Regina settlement two years ago. That was the first major litigation in Canada. But I think the session today is going to be applicable to everyone because anything you can do to improve the quality of your documentation and your process is going to help, whether it's in a legal court case or from a staffing perspective. Trevor is going to talk about all of that. So welcome, Kathy, from Petty Aquatic Center in New Jersey. Good, we've got some other New Jersey people here. I see lots of other names in the chat box. So I've pinned the show notes for today. You will see on the show notes information about Trevor. I will introduce him in about seven or eight minutes. His company, Pool Operation Management, some different resources that he's shared, as well as the PowerPoint slides for today. So I know a lot of you like to have those open or print them out to help you as we go along. Also in the chat box, I've pinned a video that I shared on our Facebook page this morning that I find really, really helpful when we start thinking about uh, what are the decisions that lifeguards make or what are some of the challenges we see with different 
aquatic facilities and security footage, things that are good, things that are bad. Welcome, welcome. If you're just joining us, let us know where you're from. If this is your first webinar, welcome. We are coming up on, I believe we're up to, this is our 21st or our 22nd webinar. We will be ending the webinar series in about two weeks. So we'll be finishing up with the month of May. We recognize that you're busy, we're busy. Webinars have had their moment in terms of showing up to live events. A lot of people appreciate the recordings. I see lots of views later, so that's a great resource. All of these webinars are recorded. They are available on YouTube. Please share them with your colleagues. They are free to watch. They will never go behind a paywall, so please do save them to your watch later list if you don't have the opportunity to stay for the whole session today. Gretna is here from Toronto. Gretna, did you see that the Instagram post today is from your old facility? I don't know if you saw that. Uh, Scott Jackson is saying the video I posted is priceless. It's so compelling, isn't it, as a conversation piece with lifeguards, even with parents, with aquatic facility managers. Connie is here from the Chambersburg YMCA in Pennsylvania. Thank you, Lisa, for your feedback about the webinars. Hi, Christopher from Newfoundland. Karen is saying, whoops, video scrolling. Karen is saying, uh, oh, this is your husband's video. Wonderful. So KJ Design uh, created the video. So please say thank you, Karen, to your husband. So you are aquatic and recreation consultants and teach using that video and many other things. You're also a full-time recreation professional. Isn't that amazing? I had no idea who created the video. So thank you, Karen, for putting together that video. I've used it hundreds of times and I'm sure others have as well. So thank you. Uh, we've got Ashley here from Austin, Texas. Scott says that they've shown it a few times at in-service as well. Hello, Natalie Livingston is here from California. Those of you remember Natalie Livingston from Alive Solutions uh, or um, Aquatics Tribe on Facebook. So she and Ashley Wolf presented earlier in April. Uh, they also provide consulting services. So welcome. Cheryl's here from Duluth, Minnesota. Let me post two other videos. You won't have the opportunity to watch them before we get started, but you may enjoy two other videos that I share with different students when I'm training lifeguards. The first one I mentioned on Instagram last night, if you follow us on Instagram, Yoni Gottesman from California, really, really difficult footage to watch. The family has a memorial website that goes through the court case from their perspective, obviously, but the footage is very compelling. Yoni was a four-year-old child at a lifeguarded um, summer camp and the camp counselor dunked Yoni 12 times and he did end up having uh he did end up dying as a result of his injuries so that is footage that can be very compelling if you're having a conversation about the role of camp counselors in a lifeguarded pool during summer camps one other video i'll post you might want to watch later is one i found recently it's drowning in a pool in finland unclear if it's lifeguarded but it's the the ladder drowning where the head you've just got the moon face at the surface and there's all kinds of customers and clients walking around the child and he's not visible to everybody around him okay so welcome those of you just joining we will start in two or three minutes so please let us know where you're from trevor is here from pool operation management in new jersey it's great for him to see the different locations of the different uh, webinar attendees. So if you can pop your city, your state, or your facility in the chat box, it's really nice. I know where a lot of you are from, but this is his first webinar in live time. I know he mentioned he's watched a few on the recordings. I will also let you guys know we're doing another mug giveaway today. So if you want a chance, I'm giving away two of the campfire mugs. Nice big, if you like your coffee, nice big early morning open mug. To win the mug, you need to comment on a specific Instagram post that I have posted today. I will select two winners at random. 
And those of you that have won things so far, please do not post on the page because I've given away six so far. So just scrolling back, I see Scott from Oregon, Gwyn from Nevada, Stephanie from Texas, Marilyn's here from Owen Sound, Ontario. Mike is here from Black Folds, Alberta. Anita from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, Corey from California, Ron from College Park. Thanks, Natalie. I love the teal as well. It's a nice different, we get so much blue in aquatics, right? Just blue like this. And I like to be a little bit different. So this is a really nice teal, uh, really good size mug, whether it's for pens, soup, coffee, food. I love it. I see Jennifer from Vineland, New Jersey. Indianapolis, Utah, Memphis, Tennessee, lots of people joining us. So we'll start in a minute or two. All of the show notes for today are pinned in the chat box. So if you've never been to one of these webinars, you can open up the link in the chat box. It's blue and that is where you will find the PowerPoint slides for today's presenter. You will find the links that Trevor has provided for his business, which is pool operation management in New Jersey, as well as some great resources. Pool Safely is one that I always forget to remind people exists. I'm so glad he included it in the notes that he wanted on the show for today because it's a really, really great resource as well as the Center for Disease Control links. He'll talk about those. So welcome those of you just coming in. Show notes are pinned. We will be starting shortly. It is Wednesday, May 6th. So hopefully your week is going well. Hopefully if you're working to reopen that you have a plan that you are comfortable with. Every different person I talk to has a different level of comfort with this whole COVID situation and reopening. So I wish you Godspeed if you're on your way to reopening. Our pools in Canada, we have no date to reopen. I would anticipate it'll be July at the earliest and it will be phased in very specifically by province. Oh, actually last announcement I should make before I introduce myself, a reminder for those of you that were interested, I am speaking at the Saskatchewan and Manitoba Red Cross Water Safety Conference next week. So it is two days. It is $70 Canadian if you are interested in registering. I will pop that in the chat box. And I think we'll, we'll do my introduction and then I will introduce Trevor so we can get started, okay? So thank you so much to everyone who is here. Again, those of you who haven't been here before, my name is Katie Crysdale. I am based near Calgary, Alberta, Canada. Lakeview Aquatic Consultants is my business. And I really wanted to serve the community during the COVID-19 pandemic because I found a lot of people, this is back in March, which was the stone ages now in terms of how we've experienced COVID. I found a lot of people struggling for information, for connectivity, and I really wanted to bring together different speakers who have expertise that they can share in a meaningful way. Everybody has donated their time to these sessions. All of the sessions are free. All of the recordings are up on YouTube. So I wanna give a big thank you to all of the presenters, some of whom we've got in the chat box today who've donated so much of their time to give back to the aquatic community. So I wanna to introduce today's speaker. Today we're hearing from Trevor Sherwood from Pool Operation Management in New Jersey. Trevor and I got connected a few, two years ago at the World Aquatic Health Conference organized by the formerly National Swimming Pool Foundation, but now the Pool and Hot Tub Alliance in New, um, out of Colorado. The conference was in Charleston, South Carolina. He taught me the Advanced Service Technician course, which is now the Pool Service Technician course, a legacy APSP course. Anyway, the relevant piece to you guys is I was really impressed with Trevor's breadth of knowledge. Often in the aquatics industry, we see very lifeguard focused people and then very mechanical pool builder focused people. And Trevor really bridges both sides. And so he was at the top of my list when I saw in the webinar feedback surveys, people wanted to hear about court cases. 
it's kind of that topic that stresses people out. And so I guess a lot of people want to hear about the things he's going to talk about today. Trevor is an expert witness. He's going to touch on his experience and his learnings. But let me just quickly read Trevor's formal bio before I let him get started with the PowerPoint. So Trevor Sherwood is an expert in the swimming pool industry with over 20 years of experience in service, consulting, training, education, code regulation, and development. He has contributed to aquatic textbooks and articles, influenced state recreational bathing codes, and presented at national industry conferences. He's provided leadership to a large number of organizations, including the National Swimming Pool Foundation, the Northeast Pool and Spa Association, the New Jersey Parks and Recreation Society, Pennsylvania Parks and Recreation Society, National Environmental Health Association, and others on code development and training health officials. So in summary, Trevor is a very busy man, and I'm so grateful that he's agreed to spend his time with us this morning. So welcome, Trevor. Thanks, Katie. Can you hear me OK? <clears throat> okay. Uh, my name is Trevor Sherwood, as Katie said. First, I want to thank her for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, the stuff she's been putting online has been great. I've been able to check out three of the seminars uh, until I got started teaching uh, CPO classes online, so I've been real busy with that. But I've checked out a couple of the seminars, her putting on free stuff, or a lot of people are sitting at home, and we're very big on education. I always tell people the way to further yourself in the industry or further your business is to educate yourself. Uh, we're a seasonal business here in New Jersey, but most of our full-time employees, they're year-round. We actually uh, send them to classes and uh, put them through seminars, and as they start to develop with us, they actually become CPO instructors, and we use that as our promotion. We promote to other people that we actually uh, train you know, other pool companies how to do stuff, so it's very good for our advertising, but this is a great thing that Katie's doing, and I, I wanted to thank her for having me. Uh, the seminar, I'm going to be talking about uh, different stuff in the industry, how to protect yourself, how to protect your pool. As an expert witness, I see a lot of different stuff, uh, a lot of stupid stuff that people do. Uh, so we're going to talk about different ways to protect yourself, training your staff. One of the big things you're going to see all over this presentation is the word documentation. Uh, that's what you want to see all the time. Um, you can go to the next slide. Uh, as far as myself, I got into the pool industry the way most people do, by mistake. I was paying my way through Rutgers University, and I basically uh, met up with pool operation management, and I became a lifeguard for them, and I told them that I would work all the time. So when I wasn't lifeguarding, they introduced me to wonderful uh, service stuff like acid washing pools and spraying off DE screens and cleaning cartridge filters and stuff like that. Uh, pool operation management was a lifeguard management company. Uh, we provided lifeguards for apartments and condos all over, the, all over New Jersey. We'd have about 40 to 50 commercial sites, and we'd have about 150 lifeguards on staff. So if you're dealing with like five or 10 lifeguards, imagine what 150 lifeguards at 50 different facilities do to your summer. Um, that's where this hair went right out the window, which luckily it's growing back now with COVID. My, uh, my clippers are on delay from Amazon for a month now, so I had to order different ones the other day. So uh, Katie got to see me yesterday with uh, my hair looking like uh, <clears throat> Krusty the Clown from The Simpsons. Um, but our company, like I said, we, uh, we used to manage lifeguards. I started with the company in 1990, so I've actually had uh, 30 years experience. So Katie, uh, I aged myself another 10 years since the uh, bio you have. Uh, I got in the industry in 1990 when I started in college. Uh, they ran pools for apartments, condos, and like I said, we provided lifeguards for them. Uh, the next year I did so much service work, I became their service manager, and I did all the service work on their 40 to 50 commercial pools. Five years later, the owners wound up selling me the company and I dropped to college with four classes left to run a management company where we provided lifeguards. Um, I did that for another five years until 2000. Uh, I got tired of all my employees being high school and college kids and my summers were miserable. I lived down the Jersey Shore, but I never got to see the beach or go fishing, which is two of the things that I love to do. So I uh, sold that part of the company in 2000 and I bought the education part of the company. Uh, they used to teach when I bought it in three different states, New Jersey, New York, Massachusetts. Uh, I expanded the company and we teach all up and down the East Coast now. We're one of the largest training companies for swimming pools uh, in the United States. Uh, we teach CPO and a whole bunch of other different stuff. You uh, go to the next slide. Um, I teach a certified pool operator. I teach certified building professional how to build pools. 
I teach uh, CMS, CST, uh, certified service classes, and uh, the old AST that used to be around. I used to teach lifeguarding first aid CPR when we had uh, lifeguards years ago. Since we don't do lifeguards anymore, I stopped doing that. I didn't have enough time. Uh, we do consulting for facilities where we go in and uh, train their staff. We write up aquatic plans for them, how to run their facilities. I do expert witness work and my other stuff that I mainly do is inspections, uh, people buying a house, residential pools, and uh, teaching classes all over the country. We volunteer a lot of time for different organizations. I teach for uh, the Northeast Spa and Pool Association. I've taught their builders class the past couple years, and I've taught at the Atlantic City Show for them, the certified pool operator class for the past 19 years that I've been teaching it. I was also on the new Pool Hot Tub Alliance, uh, the Education Task Force. We were tasked with uh, seeing what classes from each of the NSPF and uh, APSP, when they merged, they wanted some of the classes were duplicates. So they wanted to get an idea of how to change the classes, make them better, uh, putting everything online. So uh, we give a bigger opportunity for people to actually uh, do that type of stuff. I've also helped with uh, rewriting the Massachusetts bathing code back in the 90s. And I helped with New Jersey's bathing code. I helped rewrite uh, the most of it in 1999. And I've been involved with the changes that happen every five years and the new bathing code that just came out in 2018. I'm one of the expert reviewers for the CPO manual and we write different articles for different uh, pool companies out there. So my background's really varied. Like I said, I started out lifeguarding and doing service work. And then when I went to the education part, uh, I started learning codes because as I expanded to different states, I wanted to know their codes. So when students had questions, I could answer them. And uh, what I found was that a, a lot of the health officers in New Jersey, one of the reasons I always tell people that I'm here today is that when the health department came in to do inspections, I learned the code because I'd have 40 different pools. So I had 40 different inspectors telling me different stuff. So I would have one inspector in whatever town that would say, hey, you have to do it this way. And then I would go to an inspection, you know, a mile away in East whatever town. And that inspector would tell me the exact opposite of the first person. So I would go back to them and say, hey, the other person said you were wrong. And they, no, no, they're wrong. You need to do it this way. And then I go back to the first health officer. So I got tired of doing that. So I learned the New Jersey code in and out. So whenever they said something to me and said, oh, this is something you need to do, I'd say, hey, here's the New Jersey code. I have a copy. Can you show me where this is in here? Because if I have to go back to my site and tell them they need to purchase something or do something different, I need to show them where it is in the code. And a lot of times I'd get the, well, it's just something we'd like to see in our town. But there's a lot of things I'd like to see, a money tree in the backyard, but that's not happening. Um, you know, being able to go out and, and uh, sit in a restaurant or a bar and grab some pizza or something, uh, but that isn't happening right now either. Uh, so with that, I learned the code because I wanted to make sure that, you know, they knew what they were talking about and I was running my pools properly. And that that's something I'll talk about later. A lot of the state health officers or your county health officers, your local health officers, they're only enforcing the state code. And a lot of stuff that comes up in my expert witness stuff is people saying, hey, um, you know, we passed the health department inspection with flying colors. They said we had nothing wrong. We got a 98, we got a hundred. You know, if they give out a grade or they said everything's perfect, we can open. They're only enforcing their state code. There's a lot of national regulations, a lot of laws and stuff that you need to know that's out there. So uh, that's some of the stuff we'll be talking about, making sure you're educating yourself on different stuff. Uh, as far as the format for this, I have some general information. I have some, uh, if anybody's been around in the industry 20, 30 years, my first couple slides are old school uh, CPO slides um, that we used to start our program with because I always start my programs with uh, liability and risk management. I always feel it's the most important thing and that's one of the things I'll tell students when they're taking a class. I'll say, hey, this has the least amount to do on the, in the book. This has the least amount to do on the exam, but this is the most important thing, protecting yourself from lawsuits. So I'm gonna give some general information. Uh, then I'm gonna talk about ways to protect your facilities, uh, documentation, like I said, you're gonna see that all over the presentation in detail. And then I'll talk about some of my legal cases. I have a list I went through the other day to see what types of cases I've done, uh, giving you some tips on why uh, people failed in those cases or what they did wrong. I can't give out, of course, specific names and stuff, but I'll give generalizations or I'll make up people's names and stuff uh, as far as the legal cases and stuff. But just to give you a general idea of what goes on out there and ways to protect yourself. I also have a pitfall list of you know stuff that just people don't do correctly. So uh, we'll be going over that during the uh, presentation. We always start out my CPO class with this slide and uh, any classes that I do. If you had a five, six, five and six chance of winning a million dollars, would you take that chance? Uh, this weekend, I was actually supposed to teach in Atlantic City. Uh, one of my favorites, me and my wife always teach this weekend because it was the Kentucky Derby and I'd teach my class and then we'd go out to watch the Derby and 
you know, hang out for a little bit and do a little gambling and then teach on Sunday and come home. Unfortunately, that class that, um, and most of our classes, we've canceled almost 65 of our CPO classes all up and down the East Coast uh, since the beginning of March. So uh, now we're doing them online, but I'm not going to get those type of odds in Atlantic City. But whenever I ask the class about it, if you had a five and six chance of winning, everybody says, yeah, it's a million bucks. And I go, how about if your life depended on it? And you still get a couple students that are like, yeah, yeah, it's a million bucks. Um, so with that, what, what happens a five and six chance of winning is Russian roulette. And what I mean in respect to pools is sooner or later, you're going to get the bullet. It's only a matter of time. Um, we got a lot of stuff with swimming pools that don't mix. We got water, we got chemicals, we got electricity, we got little kids running around at 100 miles an hour. Sooner or later, an accident is going to happen at your pool. What we want you to do is make your facility as safe as you can so that when an accident does occur, you're not at fault. Courts look highly on people that do good stuff at their pool. If you've documented everything and you've tried to take care of everything or you've had an accident and you log that, hey, we had that accident because of this and then we fixed this area and then we reopened it, um, that type of stuff helps. When you don't have good documentation, uh, I'm gonna put up a list later of the stuff that I ask attorneys for. When I get hired for a case, the first thing I say is, I wanna see all of this stuff. And when I give them the list, they go, this is a pretty detailed list. And if you come back to us and you say, you know what, we don't have a lot of that paperwork that you're looking for. Me and the attorney are high-fiving, well, now with social distancing, we're six feet away from each other, high-fiving each other, air high-fives on how easy it's gonna be to win the case. Because if you're not documenting stuff and you're not training your staff, if you're not doing stuff right, it's gonna be easy for me as an expert to, to prove that you're doing your, your facility wrong and, and this is why people are getting hurt there or this is why stuff is going bad. Uh, what we're talking about is a standard of care. Uh, I don't know how many, I. I know we did states and stuff. Um, with that, we had the uh, we have standard care. If anybody's here from a residential pool company, those residential pools are built to a basic standard of care, the APSP ANSI standards. So if you're the pool company and you go in the backyard and you see something wrong, let the homeowner know, document it, send them an email. We used to send out certified letters like crazy people before email became a thing uh, to tell them, hey, there's something wrong. And, and safety sells. If you're a pool company, we tell them, hey, your diving board is leaning over like this and it's, it has cracks running all across it. You shouldn't be using the diving board. And they'll say, no, no, we don't use it anyway, but we're going to document it and say, hey, here's an email. We told you today about your diving board and here's what it would cost to put in a new one. So upkeeping those pools to a basic standard of care um, is something you want to do as far as residential and also for commercial. For our commercial pools, our basic standard of care is that state bathing code. And I always tell people that state bathing code is our minimum standard of care. As good pool operators, good people running pools, we want to go above and beyond that. That's the minimum standard. So we teach that in CPO and stuff where you say, hey, the state code says 7.2 to 7.8 for pH. I want to be in the ideal range. I want to be 7.4 to 7.6. I want to go above and beyond. I'll have places that take my CPO and they'll send four different people. And I go, they go, hey, do we need different people? No, you only need one in our state as far as a CPO, but they wanted to have one on staff so that whenever the pool is open, they have a CPO there. That's going above and beyond the New Jersey code. So that's something that courts look highly on. If you go above and beyond that standard of care, that helps out when something does occur at your facility. Uh, the next slide says perceived risk equals a perceived responsibility. If you see something out there that may cause harm, it's your responsibility to fix it. You're walking by maybe the shower area. Whoa, I almost slipped on that little bit of algae. Well, if you almost slipped, every one of your patrons has a chance of slipping. So that might be an area you need to sweep out each day so it doesn't pond water and get slippery, okay? You see something out there, definitely perceived risk equals or perceived responsibility. The next one is one of my favorites, good common sense equals good legal sense. Use your head out there. And I put a quote at the bottom. It's uh, one that my, uh, my father-in-law puts on the bottom of all his emails when he signs off. Stupid never takes a day off. Um, a lot of people do stupid stuff at swimming pools. All you have to do is put on like one of those MTV shows, you know, ridiculousness or anything like that, where you see people doing, you know, just crazy stuff with swimming pools, jumping off a roof, doing dumb stuff. Um, use your head out there. That's the easiest way to protect yourself. One of the first cases I ever had was a hotel swimming pool. And the first six months that they were open, they had six different people get injured the exact same way. When there was a lot of people in the pool, the splashing would make the skimmer lid splash off of the actual skimmer. And they had people that tripped or got injured while they were doing that. Um, and it happened six different times. The case that I got hired for was the sixth time that it had happened in six months. That's crazy. Twice they had to call an ambulance. And mine was the second time they had to call an ambulance. That's just great. That's not using your head. 
It shouldn't take five or six people to get injured before you go, hey, I think we got a problem here. It happens once, it's an accident. It happens a second time, you got a problem. You need to close off that area immediately and figure out a way to fix it or change it or do something different or just don't open that part anymore. Um, so using your head out there, that's the easiest way to protect yourself when it comes to legal cases. If you're doing good stuff, use good common sense. That's, you know, safety is always, it's a common sense thing. Uh, use your head out there. Uh, these are your pool operator responsibilities. I always show this in the CPO class, recognizing potential problems, informing your decision makers, and make sure you document everything. Documentation is the main key to protecting yourself. It doesn't say on here your responsibilities are to test the water every two hours or backwash the filter. You can train people to do that for you. Your main responsibility is to somebody that's running that facility are to recognize potential problems, inform your decision makers, and make sure you document everything. I always have students say, well, I keep telling my boss that this is wrong. And uh, they, they, they say, don't worry, we don't have the money or don't worry about it. It's, it's nothing. Don't worry. Well, I want to make sure. So I tell my students, blame it on me. Say, I went to that class with Trevor. Trevor told me first day back on the job, I need to do an inspection of my entire facility, write down everything that's wrong and send it to my boss in a certified e in, a, in an email. That way you're covering yourself. You're doing exactly what you're supposed to do as a pool operator. You're recognizing the potential problems. You're informing your decision makers and you're documenting it. Uh, defenses against lawsuits. One of them you're doing here today, education and training. Another one, signage, especially if you don't have lifeguards, signs are the only thing telling people what to do. So the more the merrier. And of course, documentation. And we're gonna talk about each of these different things. Uh, the first one is for education and training of your staff. Uh, initial training, your basic classes, lifeguarding, first aid, CPR, uh, certified pool operator, you know, some basic stuff. Ongoing training, uh, taking a more advanced class like becoming a lifeguard instructor, uh, taking trainings online like we're doing right here. Uh, going to different trade shows. Uh, I read, I tell everybody, I read all the pool trade magazines that I can for the past 20 years I've been teaching. I wanna make sure that when students ask me about new technologies, so I go to as many of the trade shows as I can, I read as much up on any new technology that's coming out, I wanna make sure I know about it because I'm gonna have a student in one class that has that question, I'm gonna have others that have those same type of questions. So ongoing training is an important thing. Uh, doing drills with your staff, we're gonna talk about that in a little bit. Uh, but definitely ongoing training is something that you need to make sure you're doing. Staff trainings. Uh, when we hire a new person, one of our managers will sit with them and they will go over our new hire checklist. We have a whole checklist of all our company policies, how to fill out your timesheet, uh, what to do if you get into an accident with a vehicle, how to you know, carry chemicals in your car, answering your phone, calling out of work sick, whatever our, po our company policies are. They have a whole checklist of everything that that person's gonna learn and each thing that they train them, they initial each thing. And at the bottom, signature date, we keep it in their employee folder. Uh, we have a preseason orientation. We just did that with our guys standing in the parking lot actually a couple weeks ago. We started opening pools the first week in April. Um, me and my director of sales and operations, we sat with all the guys sitting in a big powwow circle, you know, a good six, eight feet away from each other and talked about handling chemicals and all the stuff we go over. We usually watch OSHA.gov websites, uh, different videos and stuff. So we sent them all the links for that and did a little quiz on the stuff that they saw on the OSHA.gov website about uh, working with power tools, working with chemicals, transporting of chemicals. There's lots of free videos on there that you can use to train your staff. Uh, so we do a preseason orientation every year. All my guys, all my service people, uh, my office staff that might be handling chemicals, my sister who runs the office, my wife who helps out uh, with expert witness stuff, all of us get together and we all do the trainings together. We want to make sure, you know, it's a family thing. Get, hey, the season's about to start. Here's what we need to do. We used to do that with our lifeguards too. When I had the lifeguarding company, the two weekends before Memorial Day weekend, you had to show up for one of the days, either a Saturday or a Sunday or a Saturday or Sunday, the first two weekends before Memorial Day weekend. And we went over everything with the lifeguards, how to set up the vacuum how to uh, put on safety equipment for chemicals. We did a little OSHA presentation. We challenged out a CPR. Uh, so that preseason orientation, everybody getting it back in their, their head on, you know, hey, I haven't, you know, I took CPR, you know, back in school. I haven't, you know, done anything with it in eight months or something. Uh, we want to make sure everybody's got their, uh, you know, that preseason orientation so everybody's understanding what's going on. In-service training, if you have lifeguards, that's one of the things I always ask. If it's a drowning case, one of the things I want to know is what type of training are you doing with your guards? And a lot of times we get a response of, I have to train the guards? No, no, they were trained by the Red Cross. 
and that's not the case. Most of the training organization will have in their manuals that when they go to your site, you as the, as the facility are going to teach them how to save people at your facility and what your practices are and what your emergency procedures are. So the Red Cross throws it back on the facilities to say, hey, you need to provide them with in-service training. We're going to teach them the general stuff of how to save people. But when they get to your site, you need to teach them how you do stuff at your site. Do you do one long blow of the whistle for an emergency? Do you do three blows? What do you do? What's your signaling? How do you do it? Uh, is it the most, you know, the per person that's closest that's going to make the save? Is it the most experienced person? What are you doing with your in-service uh, to let them know about your facility? Doing staff drills, obviously, that's in that, that realm of it. Uh, one of the cases I had was against a lifeguard company, and, and I've actually had to turn down more cases than I've actually taken for expert witness. Uh, I've done about 100 different cases for expert witness stuff, uh, but I've turned down probably you know, more than almost double that. Uh, a lot of times people will come to you and an attorney calls with a case and says stuff. And, uh, you know, well, the one guy sent me a picture. And as soon as I saw the picture, I'm like, is that a hoop right next to the pool? Uh, yeah, it's a basketball hoop. Well, didn't anybody think that they would be running and jumping to try and dunk in that hoop? That's why they tripped on this area. Um, you know, obviously seeing the pictures right away, I said, you don't really have a case. Uh, you have no instructions. You're not doing any inspections. Um, you got nothing. Um, that's what I want to see. I'm about when I do expert witness stuff, I'm providing codes where it is in the code, what the industry standard is. And that's what you have to do it as an expert. It's not me giving my opinion and saying, well, I've been, you know, I've been dealing with lifeguards for 30 years and swimming pools for 30 years. This is the way I think it goes. That's not the case. Um, you know, I tell people that in my CPO class that when I have a uh, poop in a pool, we, my pools, we treat it like diarrhea all the time. We shock you up to 20 parts per million and we keep you closed for 24 hours. Um, I'm not going to keep it closed for 13 straight hours and maintain 20 parts per million and pay my staff to sit there till one or two in the morning to make sure we're at 20. So uh, doing stuff, I tell my class, hey, you go by the industry standards, you can open your pool right away, but I do it a little differently. But when it comes to expert witness stuff, you can't make up your own opinion. I give my opinion based on the codes, regulations, you know, industry standards, and that's what you got to go by. And of course, like I said, documenting everything, all of this stuff, whenever you're doing drills, you do in-service training, any certifications your people get, keep an employee folder with all their certs, uh, make sure you're documenting whatever was done. That's very important. Signage, signs will educate others. Signs will be read if they're seen, if they're clear, and most importantly, if they're enforced. You can have 50 no diving signs at your pool. If people start diving in on Memorial Day weekend and the lifeguards don't go over there to say, hey, you're not supposed to dive here, the other people see them diving in and go, oh, I, I guess it's okay to dive here. And now everybody's going to be diving in the pool. And now all of a sudden, July 4th, you decide, okay, we have too many people diving. We really have to start enforcing that. Well, they've been diving for a month. Good luck trying to, to get that across to people that, hey, you're not allowed to do that. Um, but make sure it's enforced. Uh, another problem that I see with a lot of uh, township pools, uh, swim clubs or township pools, their lifeguards that are working there now have been there with their families over the years. And they came up through the ranks where they were on the, they did swim lessons there and they did the swim team. And then they joined the junior lifeguard program at the pool. And then they became a real lifeguard at the pool. Well, the problem with that is now you have 17, 18 year old kids that know most of the patrons. They're going to school with their kids. You know, two years ago, they were sitting at their, uh, their dining room table, you know, eating some peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, playing video games with their friend at their house. It's tough to go over to Mrs. Smith and say, Hey, Mrs. Smith, I know I've known you for years, but, uh, is that alcohol you got in your container? Because we don't allow alcohol at our pool. So it's tougher for those people to enforce rules um, at places where they've been for years. Obviously, it's a good resource to get lifeguards, but you need to point out to them that, hey, you're a professional rescuer. You need to be enforcing our rules and regulations. It's, it's worse not to have a lifeguard than to have lifeguards that are there and not enforcing your policies. Common required signs. I listed a bunch uh, that we have in New Jersey. We are very big on signage here. One is uh, if you don't have a lifeguard, you have to have the no lifeguard, swim at your own risk. Uh, you must have an adult supervisor under 16. You must be accompanied by an adult. We also make us our pools in New Jersey post an adult supervisor phone number and name. Uh, it doesn't have to be the CPO. It can be some responsible for the pool, but just to have a phone number posted out there that if somebody sees something wrong with the pool, they can call the person to say, hey, your lifeguards are, look like they're falling asleep on the stand or, hey, you know, this is going on or, hey, the pool's cloudy or, hey, I, I, some kid's diaper ripped open and the lifeguard just reopened the pool right away. What's going on? Are we supposed to leave? Is this safe? 
Um, so having that posting that phone number, obviously your pool rule signs, we tell everybody put a pool rule sign at each entrance and then, uh, you know, at least one inside the pool area. Uh, first aid location, where is the first aid stuff? Is it, you know, you're at a hotel that doesn't have lifeguards. Do they have to go to the front desk to get first aid? Are you putting first aid right at the pool so they can steal it and take it all home and you end up with an empty first aid box? Um, you know, where is your first aid stuff? Do they have to see the lifeguard? Do you have a special first aid room? Is there a nurse on staff? Uh, what's the deal with that? Uh, diving rules, if you have diving board or specialty equipment, have rules for it. If you have specialty stuff like slides, diving boards, uh, rock climbing walls, any type of stuff like that on your pools, have specific rules right next to it posted what's going on. And if you don't have somebody there supervising a lifeguard or something, you're opening yourself up. Um, so make sure those rules are followed. Make sure somebody's at least keeping an eye on that area so they can tell people, hey, one person on the board at a time. Hey, one person coming down, you got to wait for the person to get down to the end of the slide before the next person goes. Having specific rules for each piece of equipment. Uh, waiting pool parent signs. Uh, you know, waiting pools are two feet deep. So with two feet deep pools, you don't need to have a lifeguard, but you want to warn the parents. Make sure you're there. Make sure your kid, you know, knows what's going on because what will happen, I've had to pick up a kid and I'm running around, whose kid is this? I have a crying baby. I, you know, and I find the, the mom all the way on the other side of the pool. She didn't even know her, her kid was in the baby pool. Uh, spa rules for your spas, emergency shutoff switches. They have to have the emergency shutoff switch sign through the National Electric Code and uh, caution chemical sign for any rooms that you store chemicals. Documentation, you want a list of emergency procedures. Make sure everybody knows what their role is in an emergency situation. Uh, you want some sort of uh, operational manuals. We do with our pools, we do aquatic supervision plans where we put in digital pictures and stuff. If you can label everything and put stuff like digital pictures, it makes it a lot easier to write up these procedures. I'm gonna put up some of the procedures in a little bit so you can see different ones you should have. But here's a basic backwashing procedure. Here's the multi-port they're gonna be turning that's labeled, okay? And you wanna spell it out step by step so that anybody, if they've never backwashed a filter, they could read here and understand how to, how to backwash the filter. Step one, turn off the pump switch. Step two, spell it out so that anybody could understand how to do it. Um, chemical adjustment charts. Okay. Telling them exactly how much chemical to put in. If you test the chlorine or you test the pH or you test the alkalinity, we put in this much chemical. So if the chlorine's at one, you put in this much. The pH is at 7.0, you put in this much of sodium carbonate. So having chemical adjustment charts and stuff like that. But you want to have a nice booklet that has everything, SDS sheets, the, the manuals for all the equipment and stuff like that. And I'll have a list of this coming up for you. Operational records. Make sure you're filling out your log books. These are legal documents, so make sure you're filling them out in pen. You wanna be doing a facility inspection every day, okay? And then with your log books, writing in your pool readings. We not only put our pool readings, we put what chemicals we've added and then what other stuff we're doing, like cleaning bathrooms, uh, backwashing the filters, vacuuming the pool, anything that we're doing. If you keep good records and you look back at it a month or two later, you're gonna start seeing patterns develop that make it easier to run your pool. Hey, it seems like almost every morning we're adding a one pound bag of granular chlorine and we're having the backwash the filter like once a week and do this. So if you keep track of it, good, that helps. Also, when I have cases, what happens when I get their documentation on a logbook, people leave pages blank. I tell them as an expert, hey, in their logbook, they had six different days that they didn't fill out readings. What probably happened? The pool was closed for rain or they were closed for repair or something like that. I don't know. They didn't write it in the book. I can only state the facts. So when you see stuff, don't leave stuff blank. Make sure you're filling out all the different stuff. Uh, the pool was closed for two hours for rain, so I missed my 2 and 4 p.m. I'm going to write right in there, closed for rain across 2 and 4 p.m. Um, so make sure you're filling these out. Also doing inspections. Just checking acceptable every day does not cut it. I had a case against a water park where they had, uh, we got the three years, the past three years of their inspections for the summertime in the water park. Every day with 10 different rides at the water park, they had acceptable checked it off every day. And then the third season, they didn't even check them off. They just drew a straight line down acceptable every day. That in three years, not one thing went wrong at that water park. That's, that's craziness. Um, so make sure you're doing real inspections. Uh, maintenance plans, whose job it is and how often they need to do it. And of course, your enforceable regulations. Uh, stuff like your state bathing code, your, uh, your CPO manual. If we have lifeguards, we kept the lifeguard first aid CPR manuals. Different stuff you wanna have for your emergency action plans, uh, emergency action plan for active drowning victims, submerged swimmers, uh, spinal injury, uh, missing swimmer if you're like at a lake or a beachfront, uh, accident and injury, first aid stuff. Uh, what do you do with that? We used to have on our first aid kits, we would tape a folder on our first aid kit with incident reports in it. 
and it said, if you're going to open the first aid kit, you fill out an answer report. And that was one of our rules. So a parent would come and say, hey, I need a Band-Aid. And we go, okay, you want to put it on yourself? That's great. When you're done, put it on your kid's knee. Can you come up and fill out the incident report? And they go, no, no, it's fine. It's just little Johnny's got a little boo-boo. No, I understand, but it's our company policy that if we open the first aid kit, we need you to fill out an incident report. No, no, I won't even tell anybody you gave me a Band-Aid. Well, the other thing is, if you don't want to fill out an incident report, we have to call 911. Which one would you like? And you smile at them. Um, you know, you need to fill that out. Those that documentation is going to help you. That that kid was going to be the next Derek Jeter, and they want his five million dollar signing bonus from your company. Uh, severe weather incidents, uh, as far as an inclement weather procedure, do you close for fifteen minutes? You close for a half hour from the last sound of thunder, sighting of lightning? Are you kicking everybody out of the facility? Are you bringing them all inside? What's your what's your deal with severe weather? Fire, assault. Disruptive behavior, uh, people not listening, throwing people out, uh, intruder weapon threats, you got to have that type of stuff. And we always have a 911 call example where we actually have the lifeguards practice it. So with that, we, we practice that and have them practice calling 911 before the accident happens. You don't want the first time that there's an accident that somebody's, you know, oh my God, send an ambulance right away. Oh my goodness, there's blood everywhere. You want them to be calm and that they've done it before, that it's not something new to them that, hey, I need to call 911. This, I need to tell them our address. I need to tell them someone's going to meet them at the gate. I need to stay on the phone with them. You know, all the different stuff you need to do. Practice that ahead of time. Uh, aquatic facility plans. And this is just the general stuff. Obviously, there's more stuff you could have. Diagram of the facility, location of your rec rec uh, rescue equipment, emergency shutoff, the first aid equipment. Uh, pool evacuation plan, schedule for the number of lifeguards and the activities they're going to be doing, how often are they going to be testing, how often are they going to be, uh, you know, when do they fill the chlorinators, uh, all employee responsibilities, whose job is to clean the bathrooms, whose job is the vacuum, whose job and how often they need to do it, staff emergency procedures, uh, go, a guard zone of protection plan, a list of the employee uh, emergency phone numbers, and having a toy and float policy. That's an important one nowadays. We're getting a lot of injuries because of people messing around on the floats or using, I know those mermaid tails were a problem for a while, uh, different for, you know, toy and float policies as far as what they can and can't use. Other plans you need to have, in, other stuff you need to have in your aquatic plan, uh, opening and closing procedures, lifeguard rotations, vacuuming procedures, how to backwash the filters, a chemical adjustment chart, equipment manufacturer manuals, SDS sheets for each chemical, uh, chemical and electrical safety stuff, first aid safety protocols we have right in our aquatic plans uh, about, you know, rescue breathing and choking victims and all the Red Cross stuff that, you know, anything we have in there. We have information about fecal incidents and stuff like that from the CDC. Uh, some great information on there about different stuff with your pools and uh, uh, different uh, diseases and stuff and how to avoid them. Job descriptions, whose job it is and how often they need to do it. You want to spell it out in those job descriptions. Quality and quantity of the performance standards, what you're expecting out of your lifeguards. When we used to hire our lifeguards, I told you we had about 150 on staff during the summer. We would interview 250 and we would spell it out to them. Hey, we you're not at our company. You're not getting paid to sunbathe. We pay more than other lifeguard companies do, and there's a reason for that. You're going to be doing other stuff. On cloudy days when nobody's there, we're going to have you cleaning bathrooms. We're going to have you watering plants. Some of the places you have to, you know, we need you to mow the lawn and stuff like that. So different stuff, but let them know ahead of time. We had some lifeguards walk out of the interview. The one girl was like, clean bathrooms? Oh, no, I have a maid at home. Like, my parents would kill me if I cleaned the bathroom. Like, I, I can't clean bathrooms. Okay, well, then you can't lifeguard for us because our lifeguards are going to be cleaning bathrooms. So here's a list of all the other lifeguard companies. Go have fun sunbathing and getting paid for it. So spell it out to them. Let them know what they're going to be doing. It clarifies, enhances communication between the staff. Who's the boss? Who's in charge? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that when they have to do it? And having basic workplace rules too. Uh, you know, stuff like when we had our lifeguards, no reading, when people are in the pool, no listening to music, that type of stuff. Enforcing your rules. It's your rules, your pool. Follow the minimum standard of care of the state code. That's our minimum. Okay. You always want to go above and beyond it. Post your signage at the pool, put it on your website, social media stuff. Uh, distribute stuff in the mail or email stuff to your members. Hey, here's our pool rules. We made a couple changes this year. Uh, acceptance, have them sign for it. When they come to pick up their badges or guest passes, have them sign. Yes, we read the pool rules. Me and my family are going to follow all the pool rules. Um, you know, have that type of stuff. We used to have at our pools a sign in sheet that they had to sign every time. And it said, parents, we have lifeguards at this pool. Lifeguards are not babysitters. You must watch your children. 
They are not here to babysit them. You are not here to read a book and leave them with the lifeguards. They are your kids. You must watch them. Here's our other basic rules. No diving, no alcohol, whatever it was. And we had a sign-in sheet that they would sign all of that stuff each time they came into the pool to say, hey, I'm going to do that. Uh, have a safety day. Promote safety at your facilities. Here uh, we have the uh, National Safety Week for swimming pools. Okay, And uh, it's usually Memorial Day weekend, the first week that the pools are open. And um, we would promote safety day. I was talking with uh, Katie was talking about earlier, some of the stuff like poolsafely.gov. They give out some uh, free pamphlets. You can order like a hundred at a time and then order more stuff. Uh, they have pamphlets to hand out. They have pledge cards for, uh, for children and parents to sign. They have a little water watcher. I'm going to be a water watcher with a lanyard. And you promote that to your people. You say, hey, we're going to have everybody uh, wearing the safety lanyards, all the parents this week. And the parent goes, oh, no, no, I don't want to wear one of those things. And then you safety shame them. You go, you don't want to wear a lanyard. Everybody's going to be wearing the lanyards. Oh, you don't you don't want anybody watching your kids? Okay, no lanyard for you. No, you're not going to safety, safety shame them, but you know what I'm talking about. Uh, promoting safety day, letting parents know that you need to watch your kids. That's one of the biggest things that happens is adult, you know, constant adult supervision is one of the biggest reasons drowning occur. Uh, having supervision, lifeguard certifications, uh, buddy system, having swim... Uh, Swim tests and buddy system, if you're a larger pool, uh, those things work out great when it comes to lawsuits. Uh, lifeguards, their primary responsibility is to prevent drowning and other injuries from occurring at your facility. Lifeguards are not babysitters. You need to make sure other people know that. Employees are required to provide in-service training to their lifeguards regularly per the in uh, issuing certification agency. That's what I was talking about before, that you as the facility operator or the director or aquatics director, whatever your, your title is, if you're the boss, you got to make sure you're training people and make sure that you're you know doing uh, in-service training with them. Uh, they're responsible to keep their, their certs up to date. No lifeguard distractions. And I left New Jersey code in there because they changed that. New Jersey put in our code two years ago that lifeguards couldn't be distracted at all. They were had to watch the pool. You couldn't have your cell phone, no, no loud music. They couldn't be checking badges. They came out the next year and said, hey, we're going to let them do small administrative duties like test the water every two hours and, and, uh, and check badges. Well, I went to a pool to do consulting. They were a pool that had to have two lifeguards all the time. One lifeguard was watching the pool. When I went to get into the pool, there was a line of 10 people at the gate that the lifeguard was checking their badges and signing them in. And I said, how many people do you usually sign in a day? He goes, oh, probably a good you know, weekend day like this, 150 people. That's not a second lifeguard. That's a badge checker. So they're not following the rules. That's not a minor administrative duty. If that lifeguard's sitting there checking badges all day and not looking at the pool at all, that's not a second lifeguard. You got one lifeguard and one badge checker. Um, so make sure your, your lifeguards aren't distracted. Lifeguards must adhere to issuing provider certification training too. And this is from the Red Cross manual about monitoring activities, preventing injuries, enforcing rules. Uh, administering first aid CPR, working with the team as lifeguard staff and facility management. You can go ahead. Parental responsibilities, again, make sure the parents know, constant adult supervision all the time. They should always be with their children, not having any distractions, never leave children alone when they're swimming. And uh, we used to have that rule with my company. If your child was in the water and they don't know how to swim, you got floaties on them or they're on their tippy toes in the shallow end, you need to be with arms reach of the child. Drowning prevention, again, constant adult supervision. That's one of the biggest things. Learning to swim programs, controlling access to your pool with your barriers and gates, uh, having proper flotation devices, doing swim tests, the wristband system of who can go in the deep end, who can't. Uh, if you have designated swim times, make sure you're enforcing that. Of course, no breath holding games. And we talked about the uh, adult and kid pledge cards. You can go ahead, Katie. Injury prevention, no diving, no jumping, no alcohol, no glass containers, no throwing of objects, no horseplay, no fun. Uh, my sister-in-law came to my community pool this year. I never go to the pool, but when they built it, I said, I'll help you out and I'll do you know cheap labor for you and make sure you get your chemicals at cost. I want to help save the community money, but you'll never see me at the pool. I, I don't go to pools. Pools are work to me. So uh, when we brought my, my two nephews up, my sister-in-law, we brought them to the pool and they weren't allowed to jump in. They weren't allowed to do anything. And my, my sister-in-law flipped out and she was like, who made these rules? And I was like, uh, we did. Um, unfortunately, um, you know, you got to, they're, they're very strict. They said, hey, how can we make this pool as strict as possible so that we'll never get sued? I said, if you wanted to do that, this is what you need to do. And they followed it to a T. Um, so yeah, it is the no fun pool, but you know, 
they have a community pool and people are happy with it. So everybody's used to these rules. And once they got used to it, everybody knows that, hey, they're they're telling on other people, hey, you're not allowed to dive. Hey, you're not allowed to jump in here. Hey, you're no splashing, no doing this, that. So injury prevention, uh, unfortunately, comes with no fun. Disease prevention, basic CPO side, uh, prevent people with open wounds or known infections, properly launder suits and towels, uh, require soap showers of all users. Disinfect your bathroom areas daily, maintain proper sanitation levels, work, work closely with state and local health departments. Needs for risk management, safety of your patrons, safety of the staff, safety of the operation, also saving you money. Not getting sued is a great way to save money. You can go ahead, Katie. Factors that will affect your risk management plan, definitely the budget. An apartment complex doesn't have the same pool budget as a country club. They may not have the money to fix some of the items that need to be fixed. The facility itself or the equipment, you may be grandfathered on something where they changed the rule or regulation but said, hey, you can keep doing that, you're grandfathered. Uh, the patrons will definitely affect your risk management plan more than anybody. Ever Anybody ever hear my favorite statement from lifeguarding? Don't tell me and my family what to do. I tell you what to do. I pay your salary. That was my favorite as a lifeguard because they think that they paid their fee to be a member or they paid the $200 to stay at that hotel or you know, they, they paid their maintenance fees at the condo, that the pool is now theirs and they can do whatever they want and that's just not the case. Um, so the patrons are one of the biggest ones that affect the risk management plan. The type of staff you have, the type of training you do with them and the procedures you write up, all of that stuff will affect it. Consequence of a poor risk management plan, injury to your patrons or staff, psychological consequences, you're not gonna feel too good if somebody gets seriously injured or dies at your facility, uh, legal action, loss of money, uh, deep pocket theory where they're going to bring in everybody they can on a lawsuit. These are some of the pitfalls I see in the cases. And this is something why I tell my attorneys ahead of time that this is stuff when you ask them like, hey, here's your health department inspection. Did you do anything else? What other local codes or what federal regulations are you following? And they go, oh no, the health department passed us. We, we're fine. We don't have to do inspections. You know, they said everything's great at our pool. Why would I keep inspecting to write down that I have the same safety equipment? Well, maybe somebody stole it or maybe it broke. Um, you got to do inspections. Um, but don't just rely on the local health department. They're just enforcing your local code. That's it. They're not, the New Jersey health department can't come out and go, hey, did you uh, provide OSHA training to your lifeguards and how to properly handle chemicals and clean up of spills and stuff? No, they could tell you that there's regulations like that out there, but they couldn't close your pool if you didn't do it. That's an OSHA regulation. It's not a New Jersey. So they're only enforcing their, their local regulations. Uh, I talked about this before. We don't need to train our guards. The Red Cross already trained them. That's not true. All of these organizations will say that the, when they get to your site, you're going to give them training on how your site specifically works. Not following manufacturer specifications. Specialty devices, they have a, a diving board, they have a slide, they have this or that, they have a piece of equipment that they're not using right. I've had a couple of insurance fraud stuff where, you know, they just weren't balancing their chemicals. And then they, you know, a year later said, hey, this should be under warranty. And, you know, I go there and their pH of their pool is 6.6. Um, that's not going to cut it for your heater. Um, not stating facts on incident reports. What will happen with a lot of incident reports, people put in fluff of this person said this, this person said that. When I see an incident report, I want to see exactly what happened. You know, we affected the rescue. You know, John called 911. This is what we did. We blew the whistle. Whatever you did with, with your, you know, state the facts only. We don't need to know about Mrs. Jones was, was crying about this or this happened with this and this person said that. State the facts on your incident reports. That's what they're there for. When I go to, when I get hired by an attorney, the first thing, like I said before, is I give them a list, about a page and a half, depending on the type of case, on questions that I want to, I want to know about that site. And I'll read you a bunch of them. What organizations do they belong to? Are they pool hot tub members, National Swimming Pool Foundation, Association of Swimming Pools, World Water Park, Northeast Spa and Pool Association? What organizations do you belong to? What types of certifications do your people have? Which ones and how many people have them? Oh, we have a CPO. Well, what else? There's other classes out there. Do you read any pool trade magazines? Do you go to any trade shows? Do you do any in-house drills and training? Are you doing drills with your staff? What type of drills are you doing? How many of them, how many of the people uh, have those, those certifications? And then when you're doing drills with like lifeguards and stuff, how many of them are attending? Who, who attended? When did you do it? How often are you doing it? Okay. Yeah, we do drills with our lifeguards in the beginning of the year. That's it just once a year, like that's not going to cut it. Uh, are they doing inspections? 
what are they inspecting? The whole facility, a specific ride? What are they inspecting? Who is doing the inspections? Is it the maintenance person? Is it the head lifeguard? Is it just a regular lifeguard? Because regular lifeguards don't do that great in inspection a lot of times. They walk out on the pool deck and they look around and go, okay, everything looks acceptable, acceptable, except they don't even walk around the pool. Okay, so make sure who's doing it, how often are they doing it? Uh, I want to see their health department inspections. Every health department inspection we can get, I want I want I want them brought to us so I can look through to see what the health department told them to do. When they fail the health department inspection every time for bad flow meter, bad flow rate, the filter system wasn't operating that day, had to close the pool down because of this or that, and then I have an issue where it's their filtration, I can easily say, hey, you weren't doing what you're supposed to. Your filtration, every time you're not meeting the flow rates, your flow meter's broken, your filters are down. That's why people, your water was cloudy. That's why people got sick. Um, your chlorinators weren't feeding properly. Did they have an employee manual or some sort of training guide for how they went? Uh, on the day of the incident, who was there? Did they fill out an incident report? Did they do an inspection of the facility? How many bathers were at the pool? What were the water readings? Uh, was there any other witnesses that saw this happen? Uh, all incident reports. I want to see inspections, log books, uh, waters, water. I want to see what chemicals they've checked and what they've added. If it's something to do with a water chemistry type of deal or somebody getting sick from disease, uh, you know, how often are they cleaning and draining stuff? You know, if it's a specialty feature like a, a spa or some sort of water park feature, a lot of the cases I'm getting with spas and water parks are disease, uh, Legionnaire's disease or other stuff from them not taking care of it. And that's the places that you see them, those smaller bodies of water, those interactive features. That's the ones that you need to take better care of. One of those myths is the bigger the pool is, the harder it is to take care of. And that's not the case. Those specialty features, spas, baby pools, uh, slides, you know, specialty play, spray grounds, playgrounds, that type of deal. Uh, that's where you got to take special care and stuff. Uh, as far as expert cases, uh, like I said, with the drowning cases, a lot of them occur because of, uh, you know, lifeguards weren't trained or, you know, the parents weren't watching the kid is uh, the two main things that we get. Uh, trip, slip and fall. Uh, this isn't like somebody slipping in the pool. That's not usually where it happens. It's usually on a specialty feature. Uh, they're getting onto the water slide. We had one where they refiberglass the entire water slide and the fiberglass company refiberglass right where the people stand. So the first day, Memorial Day weekend, the place opened, they had three different people slip and injure themselves at the top of the water slide. Uh, the tripping incident, like I said, I've had four different skimmer cases where right in the, all, you've seen the skimmers, they all have screw holes, almost nobody puts them in. But manufacturer right in their, in their literature says right in bold, you must put in the screws, otherwise you void the warranty. Um, construction cases where pool companies aren't building it to standard. I had one case, I've had five cases against the same pool company in New Jersey that they actually, their guys take rebound, the stuff that bounces off the walls, they take the rebound and they shovel it into steps and stuff. And we've had video from homeowners showing that they do that. Well, the first two times I went against them, the cases went pretty far. The past three times, as soon as I wrote a report, they settled it the next day with the homeowner. Um, you know, that they're just not building pools correctly. They're not doing it to the right standards. Uh, injuries to different people, different injuries you'll have uh, from people getting hurt at the pool. Disease, like I said, uh, done a lot of Legionnaires cases lately, uh, taking care of your spas properly, making sure you're draining and cleaning, shocking your spa every night, uh, draining and cleaning on a regular basis, uh, making sure you're keeping the chemicals good. Most states allow higher levels for, for spas. I keep my, sp my pools three to five for chlorine. I keep my spas five to 10 and we shock them every night that they close. And we drain and clean them on a regular basis, uh, using biofilms and uh, to, uh, stuff, enzymes and stuff to get rid of biofilms. Diving incidents, chemicals, people mixing chemicals. The one place had the labels on the lids of the muriatic acid and the chlorine, liquid chlorine. And the guy, when he came to fill them up, he took the lids off and then put them on the wrong containers. And when he came back a week later, he poured liquid chlorine into the muriatic acid. The worst part is, Two months later, he did the exact same thing. So I got hired for two different cases against the same place for doing the same thing. Uh, popped pools, people popping pools out of the ground when they're doing construction, they leave them empty on a rainy day, or they don't check the groundwater, or they don't take out the hydrostatic relief valves. Uh, they're not taking out plugs or anything, and the pool leave being empty uh, winds up, uh, you know, popping out of the ground. Fecal incidents, you know, the one uh, the kid's diaper ripped open in uh in swimmy class and they called maintenance. Maintenance came and poured two five gallon liquid containers of chlorine into the deep end of the pool and then gave them the thumbs up and the instructors let all the kids in the pool. What a shocker, all the kids got sick. I wonder where they got it from. Uh, chemistry issues, insurance fraud, uh, a couple of electrocution play, uh, cases, product liability, uh, stuff blowing up and, and different uh, items like that. 
Uh, one of the resources I said before, our company, even with teaching, uh, we do free uh, consulting for anybody. Uh, you can email us anytime. We'll try and we used to say it's for our students, but we do it for anybody. We train uh, almost 1800 students a year. So uh, we have a lot of questions. So if you ever have questions, we have a lot of resources right on our website, uh, different tools and standards showing the different laws that are out there. We have links to all the state regulations, uh, some of the county codes too, like New York City has their own code, the Long Island uh, counties have their own codes. So we have different stuff right on our website, a free pool calculator for doing uh, chemical adjustments and uh, and different stuff like that right on our website. So if you ever have any questions, you feel free to email us and uh, we'll try and help you out or get you in touch. I teach with a lot of different the manufacturers out there from Hayward and Pentair and stuff. So I know people that actually go out in the field and troubleshoot this stuff. So if I can't help you, I might be able to get in touch with somebody that actually works with that product all the time. And uh, here's our company info. Like I said, you can email us anytime, uh, info at pooloperationmanagement.com. Um, like I said, we'll try and help you out. Questions? Can go to questions? Yeah, sure. Perfect. <clears throat> All right, thank you everyone. Uh, thank you, Trevor. I know that was a lot of information quickly, so don't worry guys, the session is recording. There will be a webinar on YouTube in the next couple of days. So if you wanna refer back to specific things he said, I know I enjoy watching the videos and then pausing them. Let me leave his contact information up for a moment. I'm gonna go to questions. I but should, I should have warned him, Katie, that I, I speak in Jersey speak. So, yes. yeah, so good thing you're recording it. So uh, this is out there forever. Yeah, yeah, no, New Jersey for sure. So I'm gonna address a couple questions that I have and then we'll go to questions in the chat box. So I know a big one for me, Trevor, is I, you mentioned early on about informing the decision makers. We've all been that person in middle management where our upper directors, owners, you know, whomever, isn't listening to a risk that we're proposing to them or that we're highlighting. I know you said to email it, but any other tips in terms of how you can convince somebody like, hey, this is actually a liability. Hey, this is a real concern. Yeah, um, just showing them either the code or, you know, hey, this is, we learned it in the CPO manual. This is something we're supposed to do. Or, hey, in class, they showed us that this is where it is in the code. You know, being able to put something to it, not just to say, hey, I think this is, you know, we should be doing it this way. That's your opinion. But if you can physically show them that, hey, the New Jersey code says we have to do it this way. We need to start. We haven't been doing that. We don't want to get shut down. We don't want to get in trouble or sued. So here it is in the code or here it is in the industry standard in the CPO manual. Stuff like that can really help you. Yeah, and I'm sure you do the same thing, Trevor. You're a professional bad guy. So I often get calls from people who say, you know, can you write an email like three sentences to my boss citing the code or citing the issue? <laughs> an objective third party can support what they've been trying to say. Hey, look, this is a problem or here's what's been going on in the industry, why you're at risk. I just had that in my last class two days ago. A uh, gentleman asked for that, that a letter for his boss and said, because we started a new class in New Jersey called pool director. And he said, I don't want to be the CPO. We have one. He said, I'm going to be the pool director, but I don't want to do the CPO stuff. I don't touch the equipment he does. So we showed him in the code what the difference between pool director and so he could take that to his boss and say, hey, this is why I'm the pool director. I don't need CPO. That's the CPO. It's interesting too, you mentioned the CPO. So I also teach CPO and I'm sure you've seen the same thing. We're a large organization with let's say 80 lifeguards and four mechanical guys. They only want one CPO because they think one guy should be responsible for all that liability. And that by limiting it, then they've covered their basis rather than commodify the education and the yeah. knowledge. No, definitely. Um, can you talk about video recordings? That's the big one in the chat box. So we started sure. to talk your day. What do you feel about video recordings? Oh, there's a kitty. <laughs> <laughs> That's my co-presenter, Jedi. She shows up for all my class. She's usually here waiting in the morning. She was here this morning. She didn't know I had a 1 p.m. session today. <clears throat> um, with the video recordings, uh, most of the times they help when it comes to the lawsuits. If your staff is doing what they're supposed to and they're trained properly, having a video of something to show what happened uh, doesn't always hurt. Uh, I had one uh, case a uh, couple years ago. They, in the police report, the a kid drowned at the pool and in the police report the parent told them no we weren't rough housing or anything it was just a bunch of us at the pool after we had a little league tournament and the kids went in the pool afterwards but everything was fine and no rough housing at all and when i got to see the video it looked like for those of you that old school movies you know uh uh caddyshack 
when the light, when the, the kids show up, the, all the, the caddies show up at the pool and just everybody jumping and running. parents were throwing their kids into the pool. They were doing flips. And this was a, a three to five small hotel pool. Well, the pool, because the kids have been sweating all day at the, at the baseball tournament, they actually, the water clouded up within one hour. So they tried to say that, hey, your filters weren't clear enough to see the kid on the bottom of the pool, where really what happened was they put 30 sweaty kids into the pool, running around, jumping like crazy maniacs. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the, the person drowned. So having the video did help out. Um, I, I, I'm a proponent of having the videos good. Uh, but again, if you're not training your staff and they're not doing the stuff they should, it, it could hurt you. The one case I had, they were supposed to have two lifeguards on duty and the two lifeguards walked in and the one lifeguard went over to a table and broke out her laptop with her back to the pool. That's not two lifeguards on duty. Yeah, so that was going to be my related question. In Canada right now, there's a trend where nobody wants to have cameras because they're concerned that installing them sets a precedent. Do you find that in cases you're involved with, they look at multiple days of footage or only the day that's involved? It's usually the day that's involved and we'll usually go back for as much as they have. Like with that case, I said, hey, the water's cloudy. Can we see it, camera footage from earlier in the day to see how clear it was? So sometimes it depends on, on what's going on, but usually it's just of that incident or they'll have it from the start of when that person showed up. They'll give me footage from when they showed up until when the paramedics leave. So it'll be sometimes half hour, sometimes an hour and a half of footage, depends. Do you find most footage is just kind of one camera in the corner of the pool and it's very hard to distinguish what's going on or are more facilities in your experience adding more cameras for more detail? Nowadays, you're starting to see more cameras uh, in the years past. I've been doing expert witness stuff for almost 20 years now. Um, in years past, it was one crappy camera in the corner that no HD, uh, the, one, the one they had video and the camera lens was cracked. Um, mm. You know, so the person drowned, you could barely make out who was in the pool and what was going on. But nowadays, with the newer cameras, the technology has gotten cheaper and, and more people are putting more of them. If they're going to have them, they'll, they'll say, hey, why not have one in each corner? You know, we can feed for all of them in their people. Do you see them just in the pool areas, like not the change rooms, but what about like viewing areas or staff offices? Do you see those used very often? Most of them you'll see them just at the uh, at the pool itself. I have had some hotels that'll have them where it's multiple areas and they'll show me another view of paramedics coming in or, hey, they worked on the kid in the lobby here before they took him out. Um, so different areas, but most of the time it's just going to be in the pool area itself. Uh, where do you fall, Trevor, on competency? Do you see a lot of, uh, how do you see like these cases defining the competency of either a lifeguard or an operator? Like how does that come into play in terms of the person had a bad day or the facility was chronically incompetent or the staff were incompetent. Yeah. Well, that's where it comes before where I said, I'm going to ask them for all their paperwork. So if they come back to us and they don't have an aquatics plan, they haven't been training their guards, they haven't been doing any of this stuff. It's very easy for me to turn around and say, Hey, all the industry standards say that you need to do this and your site wasn't doing this. So it, it's easy to say, Hey, if you're not doing this, you're not running your pool properly problems are going to occur. It was only a matter of time before this happened. So when I when I do go through stuff, I'll I'll say to them, hey, I want to I want to see that documentation. I had a case where a drowning where literally I had to call the attorney after I read through all the stuff and I said, I, I can't help you. These are the like best trained lifeguards I've ever heard of. They were doing drills with their guards on a daily basis where they would throw a ball in or they would throw some and I'm not a big fan of doing rescues during the day unless they're really good. These these kids did it every day. And the drowning had happened five years earlier. And when they brought these, most of them didn't even work at the pool anymore. And they said, what is your wristband policy? And every one of these kids could repeat the entire wristband policy. Oh, if you see a kid without a wristband, that you always have a head lifeguard on the deck. You call them over. They're going to take the kid to the parent. And then they're going to go to the indoor pool and they're going to do a swim test. Are you sure? Yeah, all the time. It was as if they brought all of them in a room before the case and went, when they ask you about the wristband policy, everybody say they all knew it because they had done it so much. They paid the guard to come in a half hour early to they had a gym so you could either lift weights or swim laps every day. So they paid them to do exercise in service training. They challenged out of CPR on a monthly basis. So their lifeguards were more well trained than I had ever heard of. So that helped the facility with me to say, hey, I can't even represent you. There's nothing I can say bad about these guards. They've done everything they could to avoid this accident. The person drowned and it was unfortunate, you know, but well, the parent went got to the pool, brought her and her, her kid and went right to this, you know, right to the bar and uh you know, found, oh, what's going on? Oh, they're doing CPR on my kid. Um, so. Oh, geez. Can you talk a little bit? I know you said you're selective now, Trevor, based on your expertise, what cases you assist with, but what are some bad cases that you see or that you don't want to assist with in terms of either 
problems or issues? Uh -huh. uh, the drownings are always tough. Um, I have to watch a lot of videos and pictures of stuff like that, and uh, it's not fun. Um, and when it comes for one of those cases, my wife hands me the envelope and goes, I'm not even opening it. Um, cause every once in a while you flip through and you see, you know, you're flipping through a deposition and they got inserts there of pictures of the person laying on the gurney or the first aid squad working on them type of stuff. Uh, so that, that type of stuff is harder, uh, you know, to have to look at that stuff. Um, it's, uh, that's one of the tougher cases. Uh, we're getting a lot of disease cases. Legionnaires have seemed to gone crazy uh, in the past year or two. I've, I've gotten calls where I seen on the news, I see a case about Legionnaires at, at this place. And then two days later, I get a call from an attorney. Uh, those are harder, which, you know, if something happens like that, the quicker you can respond to that, because I can shock the spa on the next day, the Legionnaires is gone, you know? So um, they're tougher to, to say, hey, that's where I really have to prove that a facility wasn't taking care of that body of water. And that, that's where it gets tougher. Yeah, and for those of you, if you don't have an operations background, Legionnaire's disease, Legionella, occurs in poorly sanitized water. It can occur in hot tub spas, as well as chillers, air conditioners. Disneyland had it a couple years ago. Basically, it results in a bacterial pneumonia that is quite fatal, hence the name Legionnaire's. Elderly populations will die in up to 30% of cases from Legionnaire's disease. And to your point, Trevor, it's a very trendy, hot topic right now. I've noticed a lot of building maintenance operators now, if they don't have a Legionella plan in place, their facility is at risk in certain, whether it's a contract with a tourism board or things like that, it's it's definitely even in Canada, it's become a huge topic in the last six or seven months because it's easily avoided through basic sanitation and chlorine residual, right? It's absolutely not necessary. I'm hoping also that with this, with the COVID, we asked about one of the good things. I'm hoping mm -hmm. this is something good, good that came out of it for the pool industry that people are going to know now, hey, I need to shower before I get in the pool. Hey, I, I should take a soap shower. You know, I need to be clean. And, you know, I want to make sure I'm, I'm maintaining my chlorine levels and keeping people safe and not getting people sick. So I'm hoping that's going to be something that comes out of this. Yeah, I agree with you. And that even that the, the lay customer, the non-pool person, they take a bigger interest in the quality of the water at the pool that they frequent. There's a lot of places where the water quality is, is not to standard, it's below par, it's potentially dangerous. And I think to your point, Trevor, it'll be exacerbated in the next six months, people who don't maintain their water quality well, we're going to see, unfortunately, more disease outbreaks and spread through change rooms and benches and towel service and doorknobs and play play toys. Like I love that you mentioned the inflatables in particular, because that's a huge, how many news articles did we see last summer about a kid on an oversized inflatable that's great for Instagram that drifted out into a lake that they then had to call a rescue team in to, to recover the kid's body, right? Yeah. Um, I also wanted to ask Trevor about, I appreciated you mentioned the reading that you do as a professional. I think a lot of people still on this webinar they don't do reading, like it's not something they build into their work week, build into their day. Can you talk about how that's benefited you in addition to being an instructor? Sure. Um, when I first started in the industry, I told you they made me their service manager. That was because I was the only one that was handy and they saw that and said, hey, you're gonna go fix stuff. So in the beginning, they gave me some magazines. They, I went to their basic CPO class, but uh, I read service industry news and pool and spa news were two of the bigger ones that I read a lot. Uh, which had articles about how to do different service work. So I was able to actually train myself. And, and back in the day, they would give me the, hey, if you go to fix it and you're able to fix it, great. You know, If you're not, we're going to have to buy them a new one anyway. So when I was in college, a lot of my roommates were engineers at Rutgers. So I would bring back broken pump motors or I broke back a heater the one day so we could take the whole thing apart and put it back together You know, while we're sitting around drinking beers and eating pizza. But uh, it made me learn a lot of different service stuff. So uh, the the three main mag or four main magazines that we pull and spa news, uh, service industry news, uh, Aqua magazine, and uh, Northeast Spa and Pool has the edge. So those are the four. But I also we, any of the places I'm organizations for like Parks and Walk and stuff, uh, National uh, Environmental Health. Any all those magazines that come in, I'll check through them to see if there's anything about pools in there. Many pool articles I can read. I'm not a big reader and writer, which isn't a great thing for an expert. I was more of a math and science person in uh, in college and high school. So uh, reading and writing is becoming a big part of my uh, my repertoire. But now with the uh, you know now that I had time, it was actually sitting at home. I was able to catch up on all the pool. I had a pile of about six months worth because we had gotten so busy. Yeah. And, uh, I actually just caught up yesterday. I, I just read the most recent Aqua magazine. I'm like, oh man, I'm out. Now I could read some fishing and scuba magazines. 
Yeah, I hear you. And I want to say to everyone who's still on this session, we've still got lots of people here. I mean, reading is one of those things your boss will kind of look at you like, okay, you run a pool. Why are you at your desk? Why are you reading? But I really have to underscore what Trevor said myself as an industry expert that I'm working to develop my knowledge. I have Google news alerts that I read. I try and compile articles on our Facebook page. If you don't read what's out there, you don't know what's happening in different parts of the industry. It should be part of your job, whether it's, you know, 20 minutes a day or four hours once a month. I, I really think it better informs what you do, your location, your organization, if you can speak to changes in the industry. And I want to connect to this to a question, Trevor. So you mentioned early on, it's not my opinion, it's the standards of the state or the code or the industry best practice. How do you find that changing, if at all, with model aquatic health code or places that don't have good codes? Then what? Yeah, some some people have brought the model aquatic health code, even though it's not, it's only accepted in a couple states. Uh, some experts have been bringing it in. So that's one of the things that I've had to read. Uh, we referenced that, but being that it's not accepted all over, we're not, you know, considering an industry standard, even though we can use it for different references, uh, but different stuff that they want to make sure uh, with the codes, like I said, uh, model aquatic health code is one of them that's been out there. Uh, some of the attorneys, uh, not the attorneys, some of the other experts I'll go against, that's what they do. They'll put up their opinion and that's what it is. And they'll write a report about their opinion and I literally tear their report apart because I just say code says this, code says this, industry standard says this to go against what they're saying. And when it's me showing where the code is and them showing their opinion, we win a lot of cases because of that. Um, just people saying, hey, it's it's my opinion that we do this. It's my opinion. Well, I do my opinion based, like I said, on codes and industry standard, not this is what I like to do. Um, that's that's not a, anything that I can physically put a thing on to say, here, read this. You know, but that's what I'll do with my reports. I specifically put which code we found it in or who said it in their deposition. So we specifically have a hard fact that when the attorney cross ref, uh, cross examines me, I can say to them, he says, well, where'd you get this from? I go, oh, it's right here in the CPO manual. You know, it's page 72. It says about this. Or I can reference uh, the New Jersey state code says this. Or, you know, there's a national regulation. National electric code says this. So knowing those different ones help out a lot. Is there ever been a case where there just isn't a code or a standard for something that's become an industry best practice, but the codes don't reflect that? So I had a student in CPO last week in a province where they don't require flow meters in the current code. And he was saying, well, I don't need to install one. I was trying to explain to him, you need a flow meter, but he said, it's not in the code. I don't have to do it. Right. So that's their excuse. Yeah, of right? course. Um, and we, there's a lot of states in the United States that don't have any codes either. I had one state that we had to go into for a case and I, I literally was like, health department where is your code and they're like oh we don't have one i'm like how do you not have a bathing code um they're like oh well the one county does so if you can follow theirs that's that we tell people to do that so the other expert that came it was a legionnaire's case years ago the other expert came in and said that they had a pool company that was going there monday wednesday and friday and they would test the water and he said that they were going above and beyond because they tested it three times a week because their code said they didn't have a code, so they didn't have to test it at all. But three times a week was great, where I turned around and said, hey, industry standard says three times a day. And this person that was running the pool company and was running the apartment complex, they both had CPO. And in that CPO manual, it says this, you need to be testing the water more often than that. So to be an expert and say, yeah, you know, three times a day is fine, because they're above and beyond the state. Yeah, they went above and beyond the state code, but you don't have one. So that's where the industry standards kick in to say, hey, follow those industry standards. If you don't have that code, follow you know there's a national code out there there's other states uh new jersey new york florida they all have really good codes where you know they're 50 60 page codes versus you know some of them that you know are 10 pages long and literally just say put chlorine in the pool keep your ph here good to go yeah and i think that's a kind of interesting web that everybody needs to consider who's still here is that there's the standard that the code says but then the industry changes much faster than a code is updated regulation wise I often use the example of Guam, right? So Guam, the US territory had a 43 year old code that was recently updated. That doesn't mean that there weren't pools in Guam that were doing better than the code, right? They were following perhaps industry practice. And so you can't hide behind the code, right? We see that all the time. You mentioned that repeatedly, Trevor, people trying to hide behind, well, we were compliant at our annual inspection or we do the minimum. And I think that's a, a question I wanna ask you too about COVID now. We're seeing a lot of people saying, well, you know, we can reopen, we're following the minimum. What are some areas that you see? There's a question in the box about, in the chat box from Allison about bacterial testing after pools have been closed. 
I guess more generally, Trevor, what are your thoughts on the minimum that people should be doing generally? It's a big question, like to be, um, to take uh, legal precautions against risks reopening their pool and then what are basic things they could do uh, with an eye to not getting sued three months from now, six months from now sure. about what they've done. Yeah, and I can see Allison put in there about treatment with bio treatment of the biofilms. Uh, that's that's one of the important things with spas, specialty features. Uh, we have that where uh, they had a specialty feature like a water park, and they literally were like, "Oh, well, we clean the mats," and they go, "Well, how often do you remove the mats?" They go, "Well, we just clean the top part. That's all they're touching." And when they took out the four bolts and lifted the mat up, there it looked like the grossest thing you've ever seen. And they were like, "Oh, okay. Well, maybe we're gonna have to start doing that." Um, but yeah, making sure you're taking care of stuff, uh, maintaining your chlorine levels. Like I said, I'm very big and I tell all my classes I'm pro chlorine. I keep them, my pools three to five. I keep my spas five to 10. Most of the States I teach in, you're allowed up to 10.0, uh, you know, taking care of small bodies of water, spas, baby pools, shocking them on a regular basis, but maintaining those levels, you know, keeping everything in the ideal ranges, balancing your pools, very big stuff. I tell people it's basic when you take a class. If I, if you want, you get your. If you don't want your pool to get green or cloudy, ninety nine percent of the time it's one of two things: it's either filtration or it's water chemistry. If you can make sure your filters are running good, proper flow rates, turnover rate, good filter media, and you have you know good good water chemistry, proper chlorine levels, th that helps. You eliminate ninety nine percent of your problems doing that stuff. I see a question from Evan. I want you to address, if you can, Trevor, just about enzymes. I know myself, I haven't worked with them a lot. Can you just speak generally to like how they work and do you find them beneficial and versus, you know, are they snake oil? Are they some modern, you yeah. know, we, you know, whatever? No, of course. Uh, I'm very big on specialty chemicals that we don't put them in unless we need them. Uh, you know, I tell in my class, the best algicide on the market is called chlorine. Okay. Uh, the way to avoid uh, the way to get rid of algae, the easiest way is prevention. Never get it in the first place. Brushing your pool, keeping high chlorine levels. So I don't use maintenance doses of algicide, maintenance doses of stain and scale, maintenance dose of this and that. That's the manufacturer putting on the bottle saying, hey, use up my product and buy more of it. I'm very big on, hey, when I get a problem, then yeah, I'm going to bring in those products to help out. So like we take care of some of the professional sports teams around here and, uh, you know, in the football season, they have they put a 150, 300 pound lineman in their spa at the same time type of deal. And the water doesn't look that good. So that's a place that we use enzymes and we use uh, defoamer and stuff like that, that I normally wouldn't use on a site. If one of my sites came to me and said, hey, our spa is always foaming, I'm gonna say to them, you don't need defoamer, you need to drain and clean your spa more often. Mm -hmm. So it's those maintenance details and, you know, and try a product out, you know, see how it works. We, we've done that where we've found out some of them are really just snake oil, you know, they're it's, it didn't do much of a difference. The, the cost of getting that product wasn't saving us the money that we thought it was going to or, or help us out in the way we thought. So definitely try the products out. But, uh, you know, when I have a problem, that's when I'll go out and get a specialty chemical. Yeah. And if I could build off Trevor's point, I just want to restate, I see this in CPO class all the time. People are unwilling to drain and dump water. That's often an issue. They've tried to conserve water, refreshing the water, draining. That can often be a it's not the panacea for everything, but that's something I find a lot of people are unwilling to even consider. The water is just all used up and certainly enzyme might be appropriate if you're seeing a lot of issues, but there's no silver bullet to water quality. It's ongoing daily day-to-day -day maintenance that I think is, you know, Trevor or myself or any of us can see when we walk into a facility, you get a vibe for the facility, how well it's cared for, what people do if they care. Um, can you talk a little bit, Trevor, about incident reports? So you said you've seen some bad ones what, and you said, you know, try and be direct and how to fill them out, but any other examples or tidbits you can give on actual documentation reporting of incidents? Sure. With, uh, like I said, spelling out the facts is what you want to do. Uh, this was a case I read about years ago. Uh, they had a pool where, uh, they had a drowning and what happened, the one lifeguard went in the, they had two lifeguards. One went in the filter room to backwash the filter or do whatever they were doing in there. The other lifeguard was out at the pool. She was standing and watching the pool that was talking to a parent about her kid's swim lessons. So the kid wound up, you know, a near drowning incident in the pool. The lifeguard was the first to see them, blew the whistle. The other guy came out of the room. She jumped in to effect the rescue, got the kid out. Ambulance came and took him away. He did survive, um, you know, with that incident occurring, what happened afterwards, one of the... Uh, it was an apartment uh, condo complex. The board president of the condo came over to the girl lifeguard and said, hey, put her arm around her and said, hey, what happened? She was like, oh, well, 
Mike was in the pump room backwashing and I was talking to Mrs. Jones about her kid. And she, oh, I know it's so tragic. It's so tragic. And as soon as she left, she went right over to the parents and said, Hey, the lifeguard just told me the other guy was in the pump room. He wasn't watching the pool at all. And she was talking to somebody else. So, you know, that incident report doesn't specify stuff of, Hey, Mike was in the pump room. I was here. I was there. You put the facts, the facts of that case should have been, I, I noticed the person in the pool. I blew the whistle and affected the rescue. Mike called 911. We pulled them from the pool. We started first aid and CPR. The ambulance crew came. We sent them off with the ambulance. That's it. It's going to come out later on when you have depositions and court stuff where what happened exactly, but you just spell out the facts of what happened. That's it. You don't need to bring in other people's opinions and stuff like that. That, that doesn't help you at all. Do you find it's best to have one report or do you think individual guards, they, it's best that they each do reports and then they're just compiled and stuck in a folder? We did that with our guards. Um, if there was an incident, they, we had our company rule was don't talk to anybody about the incident. A manager will be there and either the field manager, myself or my partner, one of us would go there. We'd talk with all the guards to find out exactly what happened. And we would either fill it out as a group if it was you know a couple guards or we would have them fill it out individually if one was you know, say one was a bad like, checker. We used to have that where some of the pools were two guards, but it was only one guard had to be on duty. So they would switch off as a rest was checking badges. So one person didn't see what happened. So he had his own incident of what he, you know, occurred in his part because he came in after, as they were taking him out of the pool versus the other guard that was right on duty and had everything. But if both those guards were on duty, we'd talk about it first and then fill out an incident report together. I don't have a problem with that. I see a question from Corey. I'm just wondering, generally, do you see any uh, like absent rescue equipment or, or deficiencies in the actual equipment in terms of the cases that you see for rescues? Yeah, we just went out to uh, open one of our commercial pools the other day, a new client we took over, and uh, their backboard was wooden. Uh, it was cracked down the middle, yeah, yeah. No, no head immobilizer. Uh, the rescue tube looked like it was from 1920. Uh, I, I don't know how the strap is still on it. Um, you know, I, we, we, again, email them to say, Hey, your equipment is out of the, Oh, the rescue tube, the health department passed this last year. So we're fine. Now, if you're, if you're, if you're, we're going to run your pool, I need your, I need you to be up to code. I need you to have good equipment. If you want to have other, somebody else run you, that's going to say that's a good rescue tube. This thing is, you know, never saving anybody. Nobody's using this thing. Um, so you know, that's where it came in, where we, we tell our actual clients. We, we've fired our own clients in the past where we said, hey, this is what you need to do. Or, you know, years ago when I had that lifeguarding company, we, we would report them to the health department. I go, hey, you came to inspect our pool when we weren't there. We never wrote down that we're missing this stuff. Hey, we're missing a rescue tube. We're missing, you know, and you're going to have to write us up for it so we could go to the site because they go, oh, well, the health department didn't write it, so we're not going to fix it. So, mm -hmm. You know, that type of stuff uh, goes on all the time where people don't have the right stuff. And I train health officers, and that's one of the things when we do trainings for health officers, a lot of them don't know. In my area, like down in Florida, they know what they're doing. They're, they're Some of them just do pools. In my area, they're doing restaurants and septic systems and other stuff, and swimming pools is down the list on their priorities. And some of them walk in, and they'll do a five-minute inspection. I had a guy last year that came into the pool, looked around, and goes, okay, water looks crystal clear. You got that uh, CPO thing, writes down my name. Lifeguard certs, okay. I see some safety stuff, some signs, good. Okay, here's your permit. And the guy was gone in five minutes. He didn't even, you know, ask, what's your pool readings? Oh, what's my readings are horrible. I have zero chlorine and a six eight pH. Like that's what I'm gonna say. 3.075. Yeah. If you're not, how do you not test the water as the health officer? Some of them only go out there once a year, but a lot of them just don't know. I joke around with my CPO class and say the easiest way to get rid of the health department is open your pump room door and ask them if they need to come in and take a look because a lot of them don't even know the difference between a pump and a filter. That's sad. Yeah, and it's it's very much the case in Canada. We have a short swimming pool season for outdoor pools and our health inspectors are not specialty outside of the big urban areas. City of Toronto has pool inspectors and every other location pool does, the inspector does exactly what you said. And I wanna also highlight what Trevor said about the fact that they say it's compliant doesn't mean that it's safe. So. I'll post in the show notes my favorite video recording discussing anti-entrapment when I teach CPO classes. So the Avista Resort in South Carolina two years ago, three years ago, they had an entrapment, a non-fatal drowning. The kid was underwater for eight minutes in a lazy river and the drain cover, which was large, was not fixed with screws. 
Yes, it passed the annual inspection, but the pool operator should have made sure that it was installed as per manufacturer's recommendation. So that's not on the health inspector to get in the pool and lift up the grate. That's on the pool operator, the maintenance guys, the lifeguards to do what they do to check whether that's daily, weekly, monthly, that compliance piece. That's not entirely on the state or the province or the regional authority to take that responsibility. Uh, a couple last questions. If anyone else has questions, please post them in the chat box. You mentioned electrocution, Trevor. So what kinds of electrocution issues are you seeing and basic things? Because I know that's a big one. People don't realize electrocution happens all the time in pools. Uh, we have in New Jersey, actually, a, you have to do a electrical bonding grounding certificate every five years, have a company come in to check it. The first year, 1990, uh, 1999, uh, almost half the pools in New Jersey failed. What was happening back in the 90s, everybody was ripping out diving boards, nobody was reconnecting bond wires. Or your ladder anchor got loose and they just chopped out the old ladder anchor, cemented in a new one and never connected the bond wire. So when that, when that happened, you know, we, we, the state basically came out and said, hey, we weren't doing this to make more money. Here's what happened. This is almost half the pools in New Jersey failed for this. Your fencing was never, you know, you put up a new fence, never reconnected, made sure the bond wire was connected to it. Uh, you know, different stuff where they're just not, not having that bond wire is something that can cause, you know, an electrocution where they're, they're not, uh, not going to have that happen. Yeah, so maybe Trevor, can you just expand briefly for the lay people that don't understand the concept of the metal having to be secured by bonding? Sure, bonding and grounding, anything metal within the, even the cage underneath the pool, if it's a cement pool, uh, your metal diving board, your metal ladders and handrails, uh, if your fencing is too close, a lot of a, uh, ADA lifts are metal and sitting. So anything that you install or remove from the pool must be electrically bonded and grounded to the rest of the grid that's there. Uh, going all the way back to your pump. And you want to see those green bond wires and stuff. And we'll see that a lot where the bond wire, somebody changes a motor and the pool company doesn't reconnect the bond wire. And that's what happened. One of the cases years ago where a kid with a wet leg went in there and uh, went to open the pump basket and wet leg touched the pump and it wasn't bonded and grounded and got electrocuted. Yeah, it's definitely speaking to Trevor's point. I know a facility near me that did some renovations about two years ago, and then they went to reopen, and then their reopening was delayed another two months because they realized that nothing had been bonded in the in the three months worth of work. So it's it's one of those little details that people who understand uh, operations and renovation they're going to they should be responsible for knowing. But there are many. Um, I'm sure Trevor has tons of stories, different service providers, commercial contractors that they are fly by night, they're uncertified, they're uninsured, and they're just doing the work without any awareness of the liability and the risk of the customers using that facility after they leave. Yeah. I joke around in my CPO class and say those people that aren't certified that can't do a good job, we have to come in and, and we have to charge them more to fix it. Those type of people, they make my boat bigger every year. <laughs> that doesn't really happen, but I like saying it. But, uh, I'm sure your boat's pretty big based on how yeah, busy you are. We had, a, we had a lot of them in the in the New Jersey, New York, tri-state area. It's uh, There's a lot of mom and pop fly-by-nighters. that, And I tell my CPO students, them coming to a CPO class for a day and a half, they have more classroom training about swimming pools than a lot of people that run their own swimming pool companies. They started for somebody that didn't know what they were doing. They learned from them how to do it the wrong way. And then they broke off and started their own company. And now they're teaching other people how to do it the wrong way. So they never go to classes. They never get certified. And I told you, that's in our promotion. We used to tell people, if you find a company in New Jersey that's more certified than we are, I'll run your pool for free for the summer. Yeah. No, it's unfortunately, it's, the tr it's true even in Canada. I was at a bankruptcy sale recently, ran into a pool person that I didn't know from my area. And they said, what's a CPO exactly? What do you teach? And I said, the certified pool operator course is a regulatory requirement in Alberta to operate a commercial pool and you service commercial pools. Do you have CPOs on staff? He's like, well, I, I think someone's got it. So we can say we've got it. And I'm just going like, I'm not looking to tell you on this course. I'm just horrified that you are a service company in my area with commercial clients and you've told the province that you're credentialed and you're not right? Yeah. The, that's just a major red flag for me. Um, so I think the last question I want to end on, I don't see any in the chat box, but Trevor, if you could just comment generally, I know from the lifeguarding perspective, we want to be aware that lawsuits happen and that obviously bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. But do you think it's, it's hopeless in terms of the cases that you see or can basic precautions be taken to avoid 
uh, settlements in general or court cases. Yeah, no, a lot of the basic stuff that I talked about, that's what you need to do. If you're taking good care of your facility, you're documenting everything, you're training your people, you're using the right stuff, you're following industry standards and your state codes and stuff, um, learn those codes. Learn at least a minimum, learn what your, your code is and what that health officer is going to be looking for. Um, because like I said, a lot of people rely on them and the health department comes in and says, yeah, you passed, but that doesn't hold water that great when there's other codes out there. So any code you can get your hands on, like I said, reading tra uh, trade magazines, going to trade shows, learning about the new technologies that are out there. There's a lot of stuff out there that can make your job easier, make your facility safer. So there's a lot of stuff out there. That's what I encourage people to do. We take our entire company to the Atlantic City Pool Show every year. So everybody walks the floor. Even my office staff girls, they they walk the floor. My, my service guys and gals, they walk the floor. I want them to see the new technologies, ask questions. Hey, if you don't know much about enzymes, go to the enzyme manufacturer and say, hey, can you talk to me about your product? Get ready because they're going to talk to you for an hour. Um, that's how you learn stuff, you know? Um, so that all that stuff helps out with running your pools, keeping everybody safe. Yeah, and I can't I can't underscore what Trevor said enough in terms of professional development. I think coming out of COVID, especially, we're going to see leaner times and tighter budgets. But it really is up to you as an aquatic professional to talk to your manager, your director, and say, you know what, I haven't been to a conference in five or six years, or I haven't been to this local meeting, or I haven't been to. I want to go visit this facility one afternoon for a couple hours. I mean, professional development has this kind of people think it's a boondoggle where you go and drink cocktails and schmooze, but it really is being aware and having a finger on the pulse of what's happening in the industry. Trevor is very active where he is. I try to be active where I am in Canada, but really there's things happening everywhere. And if we don't know what's coming down the pipe, we're not providing good service to our clients and you're not providing good service to your facility. If you don't know mermaid tails or maybe the new trend right now is aquapoles or hydro riders or Legionella, what if your director gets an email from a ratepayer or a member of the community saying, well, what are we doing for Legionella at the rec facility or at the pool? You better know what that means, right? And if you don't know, where are you going to go to look? What magazines, what industry experts, either websites or Facebook pages with articles that you can go to? So I want to say a big thank you to Trevor Sherwood, Pool Operation Management in New Jersey. Um, all of the information for today's session is in the show notes in the chat box. The webinar is recording. I'll upload that over the next couple of days. So thank you so, so much, Trevor. I really appreciate it. No, thank you for having me. And uh, like I said, you're doing a great job with this, putting stuff out there for free. People are, are stuck at home and uh, this is a great thing to do. And I really appreciate you doing that. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'm going to make a couple of quick announcements about our last couple of sessions. So you're welcome to stay, Trevor. Or if you want a break, you can turn the camera off. Sure. Somebody uh, asked about digital real quick. Uh, your records, yeah. digital record keeping is totally fine and legal. It's actually a little better. Uh, some places now will have the automated systems that can actually download to your laptop and you can stuff like that. The health department in New Jersey, actually, if you have that, they will now, you don't have to test the water every two hours. You can do it just twice a day. So digital record keeping is something that's going to start coming around too as being something big in the industry. Yeah, and I think that that's a big one in general. I know, for example, uh, just to your point, Trevor, I got a water test kit last year from a, it was given to me, but I, I will disclose that in an eight class, but it's Bluetooth, right? So you do all of your chemical tests and it uploads the data to a Bluetooth cloud. And it was like, oh my gosh, can you imagine how many better testing sheets there would be if all of the data, it's not a lifeguard lying about the chlorine level, it's live loaded into the cloud. And I, as a supervisor, can check that. Like that's a game changer. Why wouldn't more people want to do that? Well, the test is expensive. Well, what do you want to pay? You want to pay for staff time or you want to pay for a product, right? Like Definitely. Um, so let me make a couple announcements for our sessions later this week. So we've got the show notes in the chat box. Sorry, my mouse is now not working. One second. Uh, links coming up for sessions this week. On Friday this week, we have Kate Connell and Sydney Stadola from the city of Iowa City. They will be talking the inclusive aquatics inventory. So this will be a session on making uh, your pool, your facility, your policies inclusive to different types of users, not accessibility like Adrian Spencer talked about last month in terms of mobility, but in terms of other forms of accessibility. Monday, I'm super excited. We have Maria Bella from Aqua Conscience. She will be presenting on her, uh, she calls them angels, but she's pioneered a way to 
She's pioneered a silhouette that goes into the pool and then she uses camera angles and different guard vantage points to cut up the water and see uh, scanning for lifeguards as well as different um, dead zones and blind spots. So she'll be here on Monday. She also presented at World Aquatic Health this past fall in Williamsburg, Virginia, and at the Association of Aquatic Professionals, the AOAP conference in Frisco back in February. So it will be a bit of a duplication for those of you who saw her for that. Coming up next Wednesday, we have health and safety tips, non-scary. So thinking about health and safety documentation. So a lot of the policies that Trevor talked about were aquatic specific. What about our job health and safety policies? So our standard operating procedures, our job hazard assessments, our workplace inspections. We're going to be looking at the dry portion of safety a little bit. And then next Friday, May 15th, we have a session on implementing aquatic projects, so grants and funding, how you can work to create compelling um, the paperwork side. So it's not going to be how to do a grant in New Jersey or how to do a grant in Alberta. It's just talking generally about how to implement an aquatics project from start to finish. Uh, last couple things I will say, we do have the giveaway today. So if you're interested in winning a mug, I showed you guys the mug a little bit earlier. Please comment on the Instagram post that will be closing in about half an hour. So that post is now in the chat box. Please comment a silver lining of the webinars or the COVID. So what is something that has been going well for you despite everything else that's been going wrong or a silver lining to this closure? Um, there was one other thing I was going to say. Uh, my mind is not working. Anyway, thank you so much for spending Wednesday, May 6th with us. It's been great to have you. Thank you to Trevor. Uh, no, the mug is not shatterproof. This is porcelain or china. This is not going on your pool deck. I have broken these on the floor. It is just a regular coffee mug, microwave. You can put it on your desk, write with pens. If you'd like a chance to win, comment on the Instagram post. Uh, I'll be here for a few minutes if anybody has any questions. All of Trevor's contact information is on the show notes. And uh, I think we'll leave it there for today. So thank you so much, everyone. Have a great rest of your week.